Okay, Mr. Marshall, I see attendees are starting to come in. We are live, we are recording. Numerous Media is here, we're good to go. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of, of February 2nd, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.35 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Here. Tom Long. Present. Uh, I'll skip Andrew, I don't see him yet. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman. Present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to mute, remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment can also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the first item on our agenda this evening is approval of minutes from past meetings. And uh, Chris, I know we have at least one set of minutes to review. Uh, do, which, which, do we have more than one or should we just proceed with the January 19th minutes? You just have January 19th and I'm sorry that they were sent out so late. I think I sent them out yesterday at five minutes to five. Doug gave me a five o'clock deadline. <laughs> and I, I did appreciate that you got them out by that time. I, I think it's good for all of us to have uh, an evening to look at them. I know at least my days on Wednesdays, I don't really have time to review anything after work on Wednesday before our meeting starts. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Um, are there any comments on the minutes as, as drafted and sent out yesterday? Jack? Yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to look at them. So, um, I'm sorry for that. I uh, just want to say that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Chris, I see your hand. We could put the, um, 
adoption of the minutes off till next time, but Pam and I feel really good that we got them into you in a timely manner. Yay, Pam. She did the bulk of it and I finished it up. Um, so you might want to put it off, but there were two things that I wanted to mention. One is that Janet um, emailed me about an issue about lighting, and it was something that Andrew had brought up during the Wagner public hearing, and it had to do with adequate lighting in the area where the farm stand is going to be. And I noticed that um, after I received Janet's email, I looked at the um, revised management plan, which the Wagners submitted through Tom Reedy. And it lists um, hours of operation of the business of dawn till eight o'clock. And um, in the section where the management plan talks about lighting, it says that adequate lighting will be provided as needed during the business hours. So I wonder if we incorporated that language into the minutes, if Janet would be um, satisfied with that. All right, Janet. That sounds great, because I was more worried about it going into the decision. So that sounds perfect. OK, because we do make reference to the management plan in the decision. We say that it shall be done in accordance with the management plan. So OK, okay. good. Okay. All right, great. Oh, and one more thing. Um, I did add a condition. Um, to the Amherst College project to say that they needed to come back to show you the signs because although you granted them a waiver under section 8.5 of the zoning bylaw with regard to um, size and number of signs, um, <clears throat> I thought it since they've shown you all of the other signs that they're proposing that it would be good if they came back and showed you the signs that they're proposing for the Lyceum. And if you agree with that, then um, we'll incorporate that one last condition. Okay. Any objection to that? Not seeing any objection. Um, and uh, does anybody object to postponing the uh, vote on these minutes until next meeting to give everyone a chance to read them? Yeah. All right. Not seeing any objection. Why not? Uh, okay. Johanna? Sorry. I, are, is there any harm to postponing other than they don't become available to the public for review for an additional two weeks? In the uh, past, when I mean, we were in trouble, excuse me, may I answer that? Sure, Chris. When we were in trouble with our um, minutes, Pam was posting draft minutes. So we could, I could ask Pam to post these as a draft if that would be um, suitable to you. I, I think that would be a good idea. I think we we don't want to get in the habit of you know getting farther getting behind on minutes again so okay um let's just do we what's the agenda for the next next meeting look like is it going to be pretty full we don't know yet um don't know yet okay all right so why don't we just postpone this until the next meeting and okay. so that's really it for the minutes uh, Jack, Jack, you are muted. You are still muted. Yeah, regarding the next meeting, uh, I, I, I have a scheduling conflict, unfortunately. It's my wife's birthday, and uh, I made plans <laughs> way back in the fall. So uh, I'm going to see John Mayer. Um, oh, nice. So yeah, any John Mayer fans out there, he's really good. Uh, anyway, I will not make uh, uh, that uh, particular meeting. So. Okay. Yeah. Are there are there others who want two weeks to be able to read the minutes? No. Because if we're we can either vote tonight without Jack, or it sounds like we could vote in two weeks without Jack. <laughs> Let's do it so, tonight. <laughs> so I'm kind of wondering whether we ought to just do it tonight. All right, I saw a couple of heads nod. So would anybody like to make a motion to approve the January 19th minutes with the, uh, with the modification uh, regarding the lighting that uh, Chris and J Janet discussed earlier? Tom, I see your hand. Uh, so moved. With the addition, Chris, do we need to add the Amherst signage note that you had as well? Yeah. 
And with that addition, so moved. Okay, thanks, Tom. Anybody want a second? I'll second. All right, thanks, Janet. Okay, so let's see, any other comments on these minutes? All right, then we'll go ahead with the roll call. And Jack, feel free to abstain or, you know, just trust the trust uh, everyone else. Um, all right, Maria. Approved. And uh, Tom. Approved. We'll skip Andrew. Uh, I'm gonna approve. Janet. Approve. And Johanna. Approve. All right, and Jack. Yeah, I'll just abstain. Sorry about all that. Right. Good. Okay, thanks all. All right, so that's that was item one on the agenda for this evening. Uh, the time now is 6.45 and we'll have our public comment period. And uh, I will repeat what we said in the introduction that these this, this period uh, is for comments for items not on the agenda. So it will not include comments on the demolition delay bylaw proposal uh, on the solar bylaw proposals. Uh, and um, so does anybody want to make any public comment this evening? I do see 25 people in the attendees. Uh, Ira Brick, I see your hand. And we will uh, go with three minutes as your limit. You need to take, come off of mute. There you go. Good. We should be Hi. able to hear you. Hi. Yes. I'm Ira Brick, <clears throat> excuse me, 255 Strong Street. Just a couple of thoughts on what I would love to see as a change in how the planning board does their work. I would love to see going forward more including questions in your deliberations that deal with the unintended consequences, which of course you cannot know, but you can uh, discuss what is the cost of doing nothing? What are the trends and forces affecting Amherst? I'd like to see more focus on what we do want to attract into this town instead of just dealing with proposals and kind of nibbling around the edges of those proposals. Um, and in a lot of those proposals, you can see that these are trends and forces that are affecting towns, especially college towns and cities around some of which have gone very badly. I've suggested this before, but just to put our heads together in this university town with an architecture department to create a model of a profitable building that is three stories or maybe four stories with commercial on the first floor. Upstairs, there's a mix of rental and ownership with students, families, retirees, and professionals um, with the proper setbacks, design elements, and promotes community. And just even, I remember walking into a gallery in Northampton once and the architecture class taught by Steve Schreiber said, here's some kind of Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, energy efficient houses. These are model homes. They don't really exist. There's not even a development, but here's what we're thinking. I would love to see that. Here's what we're thinking. The building, the planning department has what it takes to put together a couple of samples, a couple of models. Lastly, I would love to hear the board members uh, routinely include their understanding what they are hearing from people that are opposing ideas. Um, people like me and others that are taking the time to look at these meetings and stay abreast of the issues and express ourselves often feel disregarded and often feel, uh, I mean, I've heard many comments about how we're being disregarded. Um, even purposely disregarded. So I would love to hear from you what you understand that is sane, that you understand about the people that are disagreeing. So thank you so much and good luck. Thank you very much, Ira. All right, the next hand I see is from Kitty Axelson Berry. And that hand, I believe, just disappeared. Yeah, there she is. All Hi, right. Kitty. Yeah. I think you're on mute. There you go. There, there I am. Okay, I just want to thank you all for appreciating the importance of taking minutes 
and of keeping the public um, well informed and um, you know understanding that as a need and acting on it. So that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kitty. All right, so I don't see any other public comments, any hands raised. All right, so moving on to the third item on the agenda, the time is 6.49. And we'll go into the discussion of the zoning article 13 demolition delay. Uh, this is not a public hearing at this time. I, I understand this simply to be a presentation. And Chris, disagree, disagree, please raise your hand if you disagree with that. I see your hand. I don't disagree, but I think it's important for the planning board to feel free to have an opportunity to ask questions and make comments because we will learn from those questions and comments about how to make this better. So I hope that the planning board will, will speak. Thank you. All right. All right, so this is a presentation uh, proposal by Historical Commission members Jane Wald and Jan Mark Quart and Planning Department Planner Ben Brager. So uh, would any of the three of you like to make this presentation? And um, Pam, I, I assume Jane is in the uh, attendees list and maybe we want to bring her in. I did oh, bring her in. Okay, she's good. Here, here she is. Here. And I see there. Then I see Professor Markart as well. Mm -hmm. I'm probably mis mispronouncing your name. I'm sorry. All right. So take it away. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, uh, I'm Jane Wald. I'm the chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, and um, I'll be uh, sharing this presentation with uh, Jan Marquart and Ben Brager. So I I'll kick it off. Uh, and then Brett Ben has um, a brief PowerPoint that he will put up on the screen as we go along. I think I'd just like to begin, um, well, again, with, with thanks to you for um, uh, inviting us to, the, to, to, to this meeting and to, to be able to discuss the, the proposed revised bylaw. Um, just very, very quickly, um, a little bit about the Historical Commission itself. It was, uh, it's been in place in Amherst since uh, 1972 um, and is organized under the direction of the Massachusetts General Laws. Um, it has a kind of a, a range of uh, responsibilities and projects. Um, it is, um, in a sense, kind of the steward of Amherst's uh, historic assets. Uh, uh, we do things that, like um, we prepare and update a townwide preservation plan. The Historical Commission in, in the past has also created a preservation plan for the town cemeteries and has been making progress against that. Uh, the Commission is um, also responsible for um, generating listings for uh, the National Historic Register. These have included uh, national registered districts, there are nine of them in Amherst right now, as well as um, uh, nominating individual properties to be listed. Uh, the Historical Commission has um, been the original driver but behind study committees that have now created two local historic districts in the town of Amherst. Um, the Commission sometimes uh, publishes interpretive materials uh, creates interpretive signage, such as the recent Writer's Walk, uh, and can also uh, nominate uh, historic preservation uh, projects by individual property owners for uh, distinctions for the uh, Amherst Preservation Award uh, and for awards at the state level. Um, perhaps its uh, best known activity is uh, to administer uh, what uh, Article 13 of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, which uh, is named the uh, Demolition Delay Bylaw. Uh, the purpose of that bylaw is that it is a tool, um, one of the few tools, or perhaps the, the only uh, effective tool the Historical Commission has to 
um, gain time to consider uh, alternatives when uh, property owners wish to make changes to an historic structure uh, or to uh, take down an historic structure altogether. Um, sometimes uh, sometimes those, those projects can have some other kind of outcome and the delay uh, allows the historical commission to work with the property owner to explore other alternatives. Um, so in this instance, for this, uh, for this uh, proposal, for this new draft of a bylaw, it, um, kind of, this came out of uh, uh, kind of a series of conversations in, in 2015 when the Historical Commission uh, was asked by the planning department to um, think about how to revise uh, the demolition delay bylaw to achieve greater clarity in its terms and definitions for applicants uh, and how it, um, and, and streamline the process for, for implementation. So we had uh, numerous conversations with the building commissioner and uh, uh, staff in the planning department uh, to analyze what was working in that bylaw and what could be revised so that it better met the needs of the cause of preservation in Amherst and uh, met the, the needs of citizens, homeowners, property owners um, with uh, the sometimes opaque process of um, making their way through the conditions of the bylaw. So um, in the beginning, we just kind of tried to edit what was there uh, and found uh, that it really needed some reorganization so that um, the policy and the process uh, were clear and, and divided. Um, so each was, was separate and more intelligible. Um, but we kept the old bylaw as a, as a guide and we have been functioning uh, under that bylaw since, since, it's, since its beginning. Um, but as we went along through this kind of study process, um, we looked at the bylaws of other comparable sized towns in Massachusetts. And there are you know, a couple dozen that, um, whose uh, profile was uh, similar to ours. Um, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, the State Historical Commission had also produced a, a kind of guide for um, demolition delay bylaws that has served as a good resource for us. Uh, we also had a, a kind of lengthy conversation and workshop with uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission staff to get um, uh, specific advice as we made our way through uh, thinking about uh, what, what could change with the bylaw. Um, I guess, you know, overall, I, in com uh, comparison to some of the other towns in Massachusetts, our bylaw is not the least restrictive, it's not the most restrictive, it kind of falls somewhere in the middle. Um, as we looked at all of this information and uh, tried to begin to put it together, this, uh, this has been a process that's taken us now a little more than six years, um, but we think um, we have achieved um, clarity and a good set of guidelines uh, for the town of Amherst. Um, one thing I'll, I'll just mention right now is that the the previous declaration of policy and the purpose statements and um, Ben, do you are you do you want to bring this up? This is kind of the first item in a in a very brief PowerPoint. Um, we combined those and simplified them, um, and we'll come back to some of those points later. Um, I guess one of the main things I want to say at this point is that. Um, the name of the bylaw has, um, you know, we've, we've tried to update the name of the bylaw so it emphasizes the actual positive purpose, which is um, the protection, the preservation and protection of historic assets in Amherst, rather than um, what can be, can seem to be a, a, a more negative message um, by, um, uh, focusing on demolition. Um, the preservation is really, um, you know, at bottom, it's, it's, it's 
more long-term thinking that brings the past into the present and then um, advances uh, the, the protection of those assets into the future. Uh, and it is, we're, we are wanting to think of it uh, in that more constructive manner rather than just really focusing on, on demolition. Um, let's see, uh, I, I think you have this text uh, available to you. So maybe we can just move on to the next slide, which this says a little bit more about what the impetus behind the uh, proposed revision is. And what we found was that, um, this is back some years ago now, that the definitions in our bylaw were um, vague to the point that they did not give sufficient guidance to the building commissioner um, in um, either ad uh, approving what were clearly uh, permissible um, actions uh, as opposed to those that were, that were really focused on preservation. So we wanted to tighten up those definitions. Demolition itself, that word was poorly defined uh, and, and its vagueness created um, impediments for people who were um, applying for building permits. Um, the result of all of this was that um, many, many demolition permit applications made their way to the Historical Commission when they, there really was no preservation purpose to them. Um, it was, um, we found that there was a, a kind of a, uh, a clog in the pipeline um, where staff were not, could not efficiently determine the need for public hearings uh, concerning these applications. And um, the combination of, uh, of having, having the building permit and the consideration of demolition by the Historical Commission uh, was complex and confusing. Uh, and then finally, uh, our demolition delay bylaw appears in the zoning bylaws rather than within the general bylaws as the case in most Massachusetts towns and is in fact recommended by the Historical Commission. Um, so I just wanted to make those uh, few points um, and Ben will, will take Take it from here and um, say a little bit more about what the what the new draft entails and what its improvements are. Great, thank you so much, Jane. And hello, everyone at the planning board. Thanks for having us today or this evening. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go through kind of some an overview of the our proposal. Um, what is the a new uh, preservation bylaw? We're calling it the bylaw for the preservation of historically significant structures. Uh, some of you might remember, I think I gave a similar, but a little bit longer presentation, I think back in June now. So it's been a little while, um, but I did try to get the text to you um, late last week. So hopefully you had time to look at it, but I'm just gonna kind of run through some of the uh, broad strokes uh, changes that were made. Um, from Article 13 to this new general bylaw. So uh, the first bullet point, um, we are proposing to move this from the zoning bylaws into the general bylaws. Um, that's for a few reasons. Um, first is just what is recommended by the state and how most other towns in Massachusetts handle the demolition bylaw. Um, if you really think about it, it's not much really a zoning matter. It's more of a you know, how people use their property sort of matter, which we feel is more appropriate in the general bylaws as opposed to, as opposed to the zoning bylaw. Um, so, you know, the local historic district bylaws also in the general bylaw as opposed to zoning bylaw. So there's some precedent for that in the town. Um, another reason is also the uh, built-in appeals process. So if zoning, zoning bylaw matters, if there's an appeal, that is appealed to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And they really look more at, you know, was the process of the bylaw followed um, as opposed to kind of the substance of the, you know, was the ter determination of significance correct or not? So um, in the case of an appeals, we didn't think it was appropriate for the ZBA to handle an appeal of a demolition uh, delay bylaw. So that was one an, another reason to move it to the general bylaws in this case. Um, so, and I guess 
that also does in terms of process, and maybe Chris can expand on this uh, later. Um, really, the 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 vote from the planning board would be essentially to uh, remove uh, Article 13. Um, but obviously, we're here today to you you all. The planning board needs to be comfortable that whatever we're proposing as a general bylaw, you feel is sufficient to replace um, the zoning bylaw. So. Um, that's kind of one of the first major changes. Um, the second is um, kind of a bit more nuanced, but it's to create a new certificate process for applicants, which kind of help, help separate the historical commission and the building department review and their timeline. So right now, the way it's structured is that an applicant submits a demolition permit, and that permit is first reviewed by the historical commission through Article 13. And then we send, if it's approved uh, for demolition, we send notification to the building commissioner to approve the permit. Or if we put a delay on it, then that permit just kind of sits in limbo for up to 12 months. And that creates an issue because the building department has their own kind of shot clock, if you will, where they need to act on permits. Um, and so if we're putting a delay on the permit, it just kind of sits, like I said, in this limbo state which is uh, not great practice, I guess, because technically the building department is supposed to be acting on the permit one way or another. So by we're proposing to kind of separate those processes. So first an applicant would, if they're intending to demolish a structure, they would come to the historical commission first, get approval or uh, a, a delay, and then move on to the building department um, as opposed to kind of doing them in parallel. And so um, this also, it's similar to how the local historic district operates. We, the historical commission would generate a certificate. We uh, calling it a demolition authorization or a preservation order. And so a, preserv a demolition authorization would be required to get your demolition permit. And that would be a, you know, a certificate granted to the applicant that's stamped by the town clerk and recorded. Um, and we just feel like that's a kind of a cleaner way to do it that um, creates a record of the decision by the historical commission. Um, and also um, kind of, again, separates it from the building department. So we don't think that actually, it's more of kind of an internal um, process, I guess. Um, it only really impacts the applicant in that they will get official, an official stamp certificate one way or another. Um, and then thirdly, I think one of the major changes to this bylaw is what we're calling the two-step review process. And so um, most demolition delay bylaws are structured this way where um, first there is a determination of significance. So is the building historically significant? And um, there's a set of criteria that are outlined in the bylaw. Um, However, the way our bylaw is structured now is that a, that decision is made at a public hearing um, by the Historical Commission. And it's at, this, it's at that same public hearing where the determination of, uh, to put a delay is made. And so um, what that results in is that for structures that are proposed to be demolished that, um, don't necessarily, like Jane said, don't necessarily rise to the occasion of, of preservation. They are um, forced, if you will, to kind of go through them, wait for a public hearing, have notice to abutters, um, and then only to have the commission um, run through the criteria to vote for um, that the building is not significant. So what we're proposing um, is kind of a two-step process where a um, kind of a team of one uh, staff liaison for the historical commission and one historical commission member kind of discuss, run through their criteria themselves to determine if the building is significant or not, and then determine whether a public hearing is required. And um, certainly if there's disagreement, then the default is just to move to a uh, public hearing of the historical commission for that review. So. Our hope is that that kind of weeds out some of the um, the high caseload for the commission, as opposed to sending every um, demolition application for a building that's 50 years or older 
to the commission for a determination of significance. Um, and I think I would say, you know, the the planning department representative and the historical commission representative have 21 uh, calendar days to make that determination. And there's a lot that goes into it. We, uh, you know, and this is what we already do already. We contact, um, do all the research that we can on the property, look through the deeds, look through, you know, who's owned it, um, where is it, is it associated with any one notable in Amherst history? Um, has it, we contact Jones Library Special Collections to see if it's noteworthy in that way. Um, and really just get a sense of the architecture, who's it, who's it associated with, and kind of its prominence in the streetscape. It's kind of the criteria we, criteria we look at. Um, so that kind of two-step process is uh, a change that's being made where um, there's first that determination of significance outside of a public hearing and then to determine whether a public hearing is required. And also it grants the commission um, time to really look deeply at the decision of whether to delay the uh, demolition or not. So the public hearing will really focus on that bigger decision um, to place a delay or to not place a delay rather than um, the, the determination of significance. Um, let's see, if go to the next slide here. So I would say the fourth change, the fourth major change that was made was the um, clarification of the definition of demolition, which um, you can look up in the uh, dictionary, certainly, but it seems like every town in uh, Massachusetts has their own way of defining uh, the word demolition. So um, as it stands now, um, and I don't have the text in front of me, but the definition of demolition is, you know, any act of, you know, raising, um, uh, modifying, or, you know, or what is it? Any act of raising um, a building, and then there's this pesky clause which says, or a portion thereof. Um, and so that, I think that uh, clause has given um, the Historical Commission trouble probably since the bylaw was enacted in 1999 because um, there's no uh, guidance given to the building commissioner or to the commission about how much of a portion of a building de is, is warrants demolition. So I think that's been interpreted differently by different building commissioners over the years. And it, um, it sometimes results in yeah, it's just vague in how, in how it's worded. So um, we kind of worked through um, a process of really clarifying what the Historical Commission deems to be demolition. And so we came up with a three part uh, definition to be more specific. So a, section A is essentially total destruction of a building, so complete an utter demolition, nothing remaining. Um, B is kind of more partial demolition, which focuses on 25% um, or more of any elevation of a building. And so that can, you, can, you know, you can imagine a historic house in Amherst. Um, that would mean essentially removing, removing a, a facade or, or a major part of a facade that really contributes to the architectural significance of the building. And then lastly, uh, section C is kind of more focused on specific architectural features, like a, an important porch or a stoop or a chimney or windows that really have um, important, you know, are architecturally significant and contribute to the building. And the Historical Commission um, wants the opportunity to um, ensure that the demolition of those structures uh, or those features won't kind of really detract from the significance of the building. Um, now, I think I'm gonna give it over to, hand it over to Jen, is that correct? Yep, my turn. Um, thanks everyone, I won't take much more of your time. I know that you have better things to do than listen to us, but um, 
we're calling this uh, preservation of historically significant buildings instead of demolition bylaw. And this is where we really get to the crux um, in E, where we designate the building as preferably preserved. Um, the key here is that not all buildings that are significant immediately invoke a demolition delay. They simply are listed as significant. And then we decide whether or not they might still, for whatever reason, need to um, get a permit to demolish. So if it's, if, it's if it's not reasonable to us, if we feel that this is a building that would represent a loss to the Amherst community, if we were to grant demolition authorization, even if it's in a poor condition now, um, we apply this designation and then we weigh the factors that led to the building's designation as significant, uh, including a continued, uh, uh, you know, repeat review of sections D1 to 3, which you saw the significant standards, and work with the owner on their plans uh, to consider reuse, reconstruction, restoration, or perhaps moving it. Um, we help them maybe find somebody who would like to buy it and move it. We help them find grants uh, that would help pay for the work that would need to be done. We, we look at every kind of alternative uh, that is possible to avoid demolition. Uh, and we see this as not just um, for a visual, um, you know, some sort of, <laughs> obscure visual preference uh, for the look of Amherst, but rally it, it's an economic advantage to the town. Um, if you think of other towns that have been well-preserved, like say uh, Concord in Massachusetts, um, they have a similar size. They have famous authors as we do, although we have more. Um, they don't have a large population of college age residents, but they, have a, they are a bedroom community for Boston. And they could have easily developed a dense infill of condos and apartment housing, but instead they kept very strict preservation control uh, for a long time. And they have seen their tourism increase radically. Um, their income, for instance, in 2016, their hotel tax income was 334,000. And in 2019, it was already at 865,000. It only has gone up as people have been interested in visiting historical towns. Um, so we've been doing as much as we can to support this. For instance, the Riders Walk signs was one of the things that should help people when they come stay and look around and learn more is here than just the Emily Dickinson Museum. But it also offers a chance uh, to consider things like saving the old materials from a building that does have to come down and reusing them or using the building for another purpose, of course. Um, the concept of the, this, fun, this environmentally friendly adaptive reuse um, is becoming popular and it, it, it suggests that we never raise and replace, but we reuse as much as possible. Uh, it gives an economic value, but it also gives an educational value. So um, this paragraph is rather general because we have a lot of, if you will, um, subjective <laughs> personal feelings about how something may or may not um, fit the criteria. But the key here is that it would be a loss to the town if it were, um, if the building were demolished. And then finally, um, some other things we considered uh, for the bylaw, which, um, you know, we struggled with many of these for months, but um, you won't see in there. For instance, a lot of towns have changed the building age to 75 years rather than 50 years before it um, is considered for um, a public hearing. And um, this clearly demonstrates a preference for colonial and 19th century styles. Yet in Amherst, we had a really big building boom uh, in the mid 20th century. And we have some of the earliest examples of mid-modern architecture. We also have a visitor attraction of the brutalist architecture uh, on the UMass campus, which you know, may not be everybody's cup of tea, but it derives from architectural pioneers like Le Corbusier and it's important to preserve. So we voted to leave the number at 50 years and it does mean that we're getting more um, applications that come under our purview. And that's another reason we wanted to streamline the process. 
Uh, how long should the delay be? Many um, places vary it from six months to two years. Uh, we're sort of in the middle at 12 months. Um, we've had it that way since 2005. We debated increasing it to 18 months in order to have more time to help applicants do research and help find them help them find alternatives. <clears throat> but we were concerned that it would be a burden to developers and builders and have left it at one year. Um, should we increase the penalty? There is a penalty you probably noticed in there, with, which is if somebody um, demolishes before they get authorization or um, ignores the process of review altogether, uh, there's a daily fee of $300. And this accrues until um, it's either replaced as it was or some other um, decision is made. We retain that amount um, as well because we're satisfied that it's pretty, um, pretty severe, even though it's not as much as it once did, represented. Um, we also kept the old bylaw limitation that said that if somebody did uh, violate the process, their, their opportunity to get a building permit would be um, held up for two years. They couldn't return for a building permit for two years. Um, can the delay still be listed before the 12 months has elapsed? Yes, and we listed much more carefully in the bylaw exactly how that could happen. Um, they, a person can come for a second public hearing to show what they've done and how far they've gotten on alternatives and other plans, and we will lift the delay if it looks like there's no point in keeping it going for the full 12 months. And this wording is the same, we just moved it. So those are um, all the, the changes that we suggest. Most of the, uh, the wording has simply been clarified. Things have been moved around to put them in the order in which they will happen in the process. And we are um, calling it the bylaw for um, preservation rather than for demolition. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone, all the presenters. Um, board members, do you have questions or comments about the draft of this bylaw and its move from zoning bylaw to the general bylaws? Any hands? Maria. Um. Thanks uh, to all the presenters. That was really uh, helpful. I, I think I was around for the 2015 version where um, I forget what we recommended, but we, you guys basically sort of kept working on it and um, revising. Um, I don't think it was passed or approved, but um, I remember some of the issues from back then. And it sounds like you have addressed them um, pretty well in my mind, as far as, you know, we were debated about the 50 year versus a hundred year. And it sounds like that's kind of moot because of that more streamlined um, it, uh, step you've added in where um, they'll first be determined whether it's worth um, <clears throat> uh, an importance uh, so that, you know, you aren't reviewing every house built in the seventies, but only, you know, ones like you were saying that, um, have some sort of significance of some way of some kind. So I, I'm, I feel a little more comfortable with that, you know, being only 50, because we had said maybe it should be a date instead of a time that, you know, moves as we move into the future, because um, hopefully we're doing good architecture now that will be worthy of preserving. But, you know, it, it's at some point, it's like, it's, um, is it historical or is it? Anyways, so I appreciate that. Um, there was one of the slides, I don't remember which paragraph, but, um, there's still a lot of subjective stuff in there. Like there's this word important and, and the, how you define what's important still uh, is, is a little awkward in my mind, but maybe, um, I, I, honestly, I haven't read all, all the pages, but I feel like there probably are enough um, criteria you've put in to be able to define somewhat what is important versus not important. So um, 
I guess words like that always make me wonder, you know, important to who and, and what group and what, you know, um, so I, 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 yeah, that kind of jumped out at me. Um, and um, I've worked on a lot of projects where local historic district that just popped up over at sunset, suddenly, you know, the owners were unaware that their parcel was, you know, enveloped by this new sort of hurdle. Um, and it definitely is a hurdle. It's not something that's just like, well, we'll, we'll make it easy, as easy as possible. It really is for homeowners, like it's a daunting task. And so um, I do appreciate that you're very aware of that and that you've made the sort of time frame reasonable, but um, if it's cost prohibitive and they didn't realize their parcel was, you know, in this district, it's just, um, it's a difficult thing for me. I, I didn't fully understand it back in 2015, fully as far as, you know, what it means to private property owners and, and this sort of um, extra sort of restriction in a way on their property. So, so I'm, I'm glad that you're being very careful about it and making sure that, you know, we're preserving what's the best for Amherst, but at the same time, really think about homeowners, property owners, and just make sure that, you know, this isn't a burden because, um, uh, you know, when you take on a renovation, it's already a big financial um, endeavor and then suddenly oh we've got to add more costs to to do this extra step and so um so anything you can do to help you know the homeowners and property owners with that um is great and it sounds like you have really been thinking about that um and I have no problem with it moving into the journal by like that's makes a lot of sense so um so none of those are really questions I guess they're all just comments and about you know during your presentation things that jumped out at me but um but I appreciate all the hard work you've put into it for the last few years now and um it sounds like you're um sort of improving it so i really appreciate that uh, jane you are muted thank you i just wanted to respond very quickly to um the last points you made maria i appreciate your comments um the historical commission also um wants to strengthen other Kind of supplementary tools to aid homeowners uh, and to make the process more transparent. So one of those is to update the inventory of historic houses so that just right up front it's possible to know that you know your house if you want to make changes you may need to consider um, uh, this process of, of review. Second, uh, it, is kind of is connected to that, and that's that's more PR about it. Um, you know, when we have uh, appropriate lists, good lists, we can be more proactive in um, contacting homeowners uh, at the outset. And then finally, um, you know, I think homeowners or um, small property owners are if if they enter a project and they're kind of unaware of these. Um, of these conditions or requirements, you know, what we would really like to have is um, available funding to assist them with whatever kind of research or evaluation or assessment um, would, would help them understand uh, what the condition of their house is and whether, uh, you know, that would be a, you know, I think that would be a service that, that we could do were the funding available. All right, thanks, Jane. Uh, next board comment from Tom Lawn. Sure, thanks. And thanks everyone for your presentations. Um, I'm gonna piggyback just a little bit on some of what Maria was saying and, and some of your comments, Jane, as well. Um, I, I think I also do have a concern with, and it's not a concern, I actually really appreciate what you're trying to accomplish and, and it's very thoughtful. Um, but I think like Maria, there's a lot of vagueness and subjectivity in, in what is preserved and what is not. And I think that your the, the comment about cost is, is not just one of whether someone's making a renovation, but it's actually a piece of, you know, let's say it's something they can't sustain on their property anymore, something that's falling down. Um, and has nothing to do with whether or not they want to make their house bigger or better or do something different. But Again, yes, that you can support um, that assessment of that, but who's going to support actually keeping this thing afloat? And I, I noticed in the bylaw there's this conversation about 
can it be moved? And, can, and those explorations, I think, are fantastic. But again, like if the end burden falls on an owner who didn't know that this was something that was significant until the you know your commission said so, I, I find that to be a that's a burden on the, the homeowners that I'd like to try to protect as much as possible. And again, I think you're doing a really good job of that, but I do think there's limits to what this law is actually saying um, to actually support them. Um, so that's just one thought, and I think it's just piggybacking a little bit on what Marie was saying. But um, my other question about the shift from zoning to general bylaw, I guess I just need some clarification on what that, what are the implications of that? And I don't, I don't, I guess I don't understand it enough to know what that means and whether this moves out of someone's purview and into someone else's or who, who doesn't have oversight over that. So I guess I'm just interested in, in knowing a little bit more about that as a board newbie. Well, not newbie, but relatively compared to some people. Do any of the presenters want to respond to that? I will say I had a similar question, which is if the appeals are currently held heard by the Zoning Board of Appeals, who would hear the appeals under this new regimen? I can answer that if you like. Sure. Um, the uh, Pioneer Valley um, Planning Commission hears um, abutters or reviewers who are concerned. That's where the appeal would go. Uh, it follows the Massachusetts Legislature General Laws, Section 8. And it's since it's not a zoning question, it wouldn't, it wouldn't really fit the zoning um, board anyway. Um, it, it has to go to the regional planning agency according to Massachusetts law. And so since it would go there anyway, there's no reason to really have it go through the zoning process. And Ben, you can probably explain better where the placement, why the placement was in the, I don't know, you weren't here either, none of us were here, uh, in the zoning bylaw to begin with. Do you know? Um, I'm not seeing Ben's hand, but I'm seeing Chris's hand. Chris, do you want to comment on that? So what I understand is that um, we were one of the first towns to adopt a demolition delay bylaw, and it was a long time ago. And um, when we did adopt it, we didn't really have uh, models to follow. And um, the people who were working on it were familiar with the zoning bylaw, so they decided to put it into the zoning bylaw. And so that's how it came about to be in the zoning bylaw in my understanding of the situation. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, are there other implications of this that you could share with us that are kind of along the lines of what Tom was asking? You were asking me? Uh, I'll ask uh, you, know, you or Ben or uh, Jane or Jan. I wanted to um, kind of discuss something that Jan brought up. Jan brought up the issue of appeal and we understand that the local historic commission, local district historic commission, I don't know if I said that correctly, but anyway, their appeals go to Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. But my understanding of this bylaw is that appeals would go to superior court and perhaps we want to call on Rob Mora to clarify that because he's more familiar with um, this type of appeal, having worked in other cities and towns. All right, uh, Rob, are you there? I am here. Uh, Hello, yeah, Rob. so I think that's that's um, you know the way we understand it is that we are not uh, prescribing the appeals process that is included in the local historic district. Uh, general bylaw. So by by not doing that, the you know the the aggrieving party would would uh, file their complaint in superior court against a decision that's made by the historic commission. Of course, that you know that's a decision that can be made now. You know, as we move along with how we want this bylaw to come together. But I believe that's what was done up to this point. Okay. And that, as I understand it, that's the appeal of the either of step one or step two. I mean, there, there's because not everything goes through 
the two-step process if the step one uh, evaluation is unanimous? I would say so. I mean, I think in, in either case, you know, an aggrieved person could file a complaint against the town for a decision being made at either level, and it would, it would take that same process. Okay. All right, Tom, I assume that that's, that's the extent of answers we're going to get. That's fine. All right. Uh, Janet, you've got the next hand. Um, I have... I have a few questions and then sort of a long series of comments, but I'd, I'd like to start with my questions. First of all, I want to thank Ben for the comparison chart that really helped me see the changes and so I could kind of track them more easily. Um, and then I would love to help the Historic Commission end their six year odyssey on this bylaw. Um, it looks like a lot of work went into it. And I listened to the um, meeting with Chris Skelly, which I thought was super informative and it helped me understand what the historic commission was grappling with like what like how that the old bylaw or the current bylaw worked for you or didn't work for you so that that what i found very illuminating although a very long meeting too and um uh, chris kelly was excellent so my questions are well kind of what tom was asking so my question was like who appeals what when and who can appeal it so it sounds to me like the historic commission decides or the, the historic somebody on the historic commission and the planning staff decide it's not significant. So that can go to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and then go to Superior Court. Is that the path? I think what we've heard is that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is not involved and that any appeal by anyone of that decision, whether it's the owner, the abutter, or some other party of standing would go straight to Superior Court. Is that true, Rob? Uh, I see him shaking his head. Yeah, that, so, that's correct. So that's it's correct. only only inside of a local historic district. Oh, that, okay. That the appeal goes, that an appeal of the decision by the local historic district, not these, not this decision, yeah. um, would go to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Okay, and then Rob, could somebody appeal your granting of a demolition permit? Yes. So, and, the, the, and, and right, so the, the demolition permit, and that's what happens now under the current bylaw in order to actually appeal the decision um, related to the demolition delay, they'd have to wait for the building permit, the, the, the demolition permit to, to be issued uh, and appeal that, which would be heard by the Zoning Board of Appeals first. And then they could appeal that. Okay, that, that helps me. Um, uh, uh, Janet, I'm seeing Jane's hand. Let, she may have a comment on that particular yeah, question. Just a quick comment. In this two-step plan, certainly step one or step two could be appealed, but step one is really only a declaration of whether the building is significant or not. And so there's not, there's not a threatening action or there's not a, you know, it's, I think it's unlikely that there, that that would be in practice uh, would would invoke an appeal. It but would be when the permit was issued. Okay. Little, but, okay. The, but there are instances where we only have step one. So, so if step one were to require the dem, require the delay, for instance, the owner might appeal that. If the if the dis, true, no. Step one does not involve a delay. No delay is issued until you proceed through step two. Okay. And if a decision is that the building is not significant, and uh, who would have standing to, to appeal that? Yeah, good question. And, and a would, butter would. You know, the next door neighbor could, you know, uh, take take um, issue with the decision to not consider it a significant structure. Uh, so it it, ha it can't just be some sort of random interested person who's interested as a hobby, you know, for a society for preservation of undistinguished mid mid century houses. I think that's a legal question. For yeah, 
I think, I, I think so. that's a that's a that standing issue is a sticky wicket, and it's um, there are cases all over the place. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, um, what happens during the demolition? So the demolition delay is issued. Nobody can build for twelve months, and the Corstora Commission sees this as a time for like, can we do a better plan? Can someone buy this property? Does somebody want to? Do we want to move it somewhere? But during that period, can the person, can the property owner apply for a building permit and just start going through the whole process of either the ZBA, the planning board, the building commissioner, and just have a second process going forward? Because that, because it sounds like, I thought the answer to that was yes, because it sounds like if they get all their ducks in order that way, they could come back and say, can you just make this shorter because I'm ready to go. It, and that seems to be working against the 12 month purposes. Can, can that happen? Or does during the delay, everything gets static? The person reads, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, Rob? Uh, yeah, during, during the delay period, everything does not have to stop. So the applicant can continue through all the other permitting, you know, conservation commissions, zoning board of appeals. And now that we're disconnecting the demolition permit, uh, and the demo delay or uh, preserved, presumably preserved certificate, um, they actually could apply and receive a building permit if, if they wanted to, you know, go to that step. Of course, there's time limits to the building permit. It may expire and may not make sense to do that, but uh, it doesn't stop their, their process with all the other approvals that are needed. Okay. And I think, Janet, rather, if they did that, they would probably just try to time it so that they were getting their building permit at the point when the delay expires, uh, rather than coming back and trying to ex shorten the delay. Does that sort of undercut the purpose of the delay, which is trying to work with the property owner on some other solution to, the, to, to how to preserve the building or the the look or the porch or, or whatever, Does, doesn't that sort of cut against that goal? That'd be a question for historic commission people if they could. Yeah, I, I'm gonna invite Jan to comment on this too, but um, I think it actually works more in favor of, you know, we were talking about um, homeowners. I, I think this is a, more a, applicable to homeowners than perhaps to developers who um, can be uh, really inconvenienced by a lengthy, pointless delay. Um, so I, I think it is encouraging to homeowners probably to, to allow the historical commission to, to work with them during that period um, to find alternatives. It, it, sometimes the alternatives may be less about doing something different with the structure and more about doing something better with it. Um, and I, that, um, I think the two pro procedures in that case would work hand in hand. Um, mm -hmm. Jan, do you wanna, yeah, I was comment? just thinking with homeowners, we deal a lot with outbuildings, you know, barns and other things that you, you somebody mentioned, I think Maria mentioned that they can't just always afford to keep something up. It's not that they necessarily want to get rid of it, but they can't afford to maintain it. And <clears throat> often there isn't even a plan to <clears throat> replace it with a building. It isn't always about getting a building permit. Sometimes it's just about getting rid of something that's falling apart. And if we can find a grant, or we can find somebody who wants to buy the barn and move it or reconstruct it elsewhere, um, that kind of thing doesn't have anything to do with a building permit. And if they are building, they might be wanting to take, say, a porch off and put in you know, a simple modern one. And if we can help them with funds or give them an idea of how to use the materials, that can work within their plans um, as they're proposing. You know, it'll still be the same footprint, the same, you know, essential item. It's just that we're trying to get them to reuse as much of the material and the look as possible. So I think what you're saying um, is true. It would be better for them if everything kept moving, but I don't think this will get in the way. 
Um, my, right. Thanks, my Jan Janet. I do see a couple other people that have hands. So why don't you do one more of your many questions and then we'll come back to you later. The other one I think is a quick question. Um, Chris Skelly talked about um, creating a list of significant properties. Um, and is, is the Historic Commission looking at that as part of their, you know, because if, if people knew their property was significant, um, it kind of helps cut to the chase a little bit. Are you putting that list together or thinking about that? Because I didn't see that in the bylaw. But yeah, that's that is a historical commission activity. It's not it's not part of the bylaw and doesn't I think doesn't really belong there. We have a uh, there is an inventory of um, historic properties in Amherst that is I think it's uh, about a thousand or twelve hundred properties, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, significant properties in Amherst are also entered into uh, a state database which is okay. easily and publicly accessible. So the job of the historical commission really would be to update mm -hmm. the, the inventory list. Um, you know, that was created, uh, I think originally it was, well, the last time that it was really pulled together was um, with the creation of the Amherst Preservation Plan. And the Amherst, the historical commission is in the next year or so updating that preservation plan. And, okay. you know, that's a, that's one of the priority activities in the plan. We've also been working with the PVBC, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on a list of outbuildings. I'm doing an inventory and very specific information for them. And they've been doing what a hundred at a time. I think there's 200 plus. Uh, and we've been um, every couple of years pulling money for that and helping um, do that list. So, and we would like to do more. We have a lot of ideas about what we'd like to have, but uh, we just don't have the time as I'm sure you all can understand. All right, thanks everyone. Um, and uh, Jack, why don't you ask a question or two? Uh, well, my, I'm a little bit on a sidebar. I don't know if Johanna had her hand up and then it went down. It maybe maybe she should speak before me. But, uh, well, if you mute yourself, we'll go on to Johanna. Okay, Johanna. Thanks so much. Um, really appreciate the presentation. And um, I agree that the side-by-side -side is really helpful. And I feel like the flow of the bylaw is more logical and much more concise. So appreciating that aspect of it. I am still struggling a little bit to understand exactly what the experience of an owner of one of these properties would be. So I was hoping maybe one of you could actually just like walk through kind of like the play-by-play -play of what the experience would be for somebody who, let's say, yeah, has an outbuilding that is torn down and they want to get rid of it and just like walk through what the process would be. Ben, would you like to take that? Um, sure. Um, so somebody um, prepares an application. It's a $75 fee to prepare for a permit for demolition. Um, goes to the planning department. According to the new system, a member of the historical commission and a member of the planning department would look at what's um, being requested. And if it is something that is just like you know a lean-to on the back of a house or an old, um, you know, I don't know, ice house that was rebuilt with cinder blocks or something, and they say no, it's not significant. That's fine. Then they get it, they get the permit. Sorry, my cat keeps walking in front of the camera. Um, and if they do determine it's significant, then um, they, the owner is advised that it's going to go to the Historical Commission for public review. And we set a meeting date. Uh, all the timelines are in the bylaw. And um, they come to that meeting and they present their project to us. Uh, I can't really, yeah. And um, we uh, have, meanwhile, there's been research done on the history of the property, the actual building, that kind of thing. Planning department brings that information to us. We've looked at it before the meeting. Many of us drive by it or you know, look at the photos or whatever and do our own bit of research. And then at the meeting, we listen to their proposal and 
discuss in front of them our criteria for what would you know can make it significant or on the, the next level preferably preserved and at that meeting we determine and so they know when they leave the meeting whether or not we asked for a delay or we granted them the permit and then that's it if it's a delay then that they know that they can go on as rob said but that's going to hold for a year unless they can follow the steps that we've suggested working with us for alternatives. And then if they find either that simply won't work, you know, like they, they're trying to sell the building for materials, they're trying to get it moved, it isn't, or they do manage it, then they come back to us when they're, they feel they're ready and we can lift the delay. Otherwise it just runs the 12 months. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And then I have just one question about the, at the very front end, um, they would know that they are one of these places either because they've been notified by the historical commission or well when they go to get a building permit they'll be told if they didn't already know is that right rob he's gone ben i would guess that there's a few thresholds at the beginning so first um if it's a building that's younger than 50 years um then it has nothing Doesn't, to do with us yeah, it right, just yeah. it just flies through the permitting pathway it, I'd, i would say the first flag is if it's a building structure that's 50 years or older and then um if it meets the criteria of de demolition which we have that or if it's in part. a historic district that's the other obvious flag yeah if it's in a historic district but if it's older than 50 years it I mean, it's not going to be listed as significant, so it doesn't even building, um, but planning people and historical commission people don't even talk about it. Then, yeah. but really, it's, it's that building permit stage that kind of triggers the um, investigation on the part of the town of whether this would apply. Okay, great. Those are all my questions. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Johanna. I want to just ask uh, if it's in a local historic district. How does this process interact with the historic districts process? Because that seems like a kind of completely separate group with different appeal bodies and whatever timeline it sets for itself. Um, so as it stands now um, with the current bylaw and the proposed bylaw, um, applicants in the historic district commission proposing demolition uh, go through both processes. So it would be first, typically it's first reviewed by the local historic district commission because they you know, have a bit more authority and are working uh, in that smaller geographic area. And then the applicant would come before the historical commission. Um, that's how it's been working for, and it it's there. there it, it, yeah, I guess there's maybe one one or two a year where it's a demolition in the historic district, and it comes before both bodies. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris Brestrup, you still have your hand up. Is that a legacy? No, I wanted to address Janet's question about whether people can come uh, go through their land use permit process during the demo delay. And that is true, they can do that, but they can do it either with the current bylaw or with the new bylaw, it doesn't matter which one. Um, so that's the question, that's the answer to that question. But I also wanted to address um, this process of going through the local historic district and the historical commission, and just point out that the local historic district commission has absolute um, ability to refuse to allow someone to demolish something. Um, and it's not a demo delay. It's like, no, you cannot demolish that. So presumably if they went through the local historic district commission first and the, that commission determined that whatever it is couldn't be demolished, then I'm not sure how mm, useful or onerous or whatever, whatever adjective you wanna use, um, it would be to go to the historical commission they would probably still have to do it, but it may not, it may not matter. I mean, I don't want to <laughs> make it seem as if the historical commission isn't very valuable, but the local historic district commission does have that authority to say, no, you cannot demolish this. Okay, that's okay. it. Thanks, Chris. 
Jack, we're back to you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm glad that the, the Historical Commission is, uh, you know, leaning on and dependent on uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission because, you know, there's, I think it's, it's such a good uh, group and they have a lot of expertise. So I was glad to hear that. But uh, I guess just from my observation, it seems like Amherst has been, well, by virtue, you know, mainly <laughs> of Barry Roberts, uh, very successful in terms of of moving, uh, you know, historic buildings. And I'm wondering, um, and that has, I, I don't know, it just seems to me like this, that option has, um, you know, happened more frequent than perhaps other, other towns for whatever reason. But I'm wondering how that figures in to the process. And uh, again, it, you know, it seems like, you know, people are very, you know, appreciative of the historic buildings. And if it, if there's development that requires, you know, demo, then that, that becomes very much an option. So I'm just wondering how that figures into uh, the proposed, you know, bylaw. And, yeah, that, okay. that is one of the options for, um, to work out with a with a homeowner there there are examples that i mean you know moving houses was kind of a fairly common activity in the 19th century and less so now but um there had there has been at least one case um of a uh, where the historical commission reviewed um an application uh for a house on south pleasant street uh and after the historical commission heard that that uh, request, um, that's that's a time at which Barry Roberts came and moved to the house. So it, it has it has has certainly been uh, in it, it's one of the alternatives that the historical commission likes to explore with with owners. Um, so it, it's very much a part of the process. It would happen more now if we had buried cables and wires. It happened more in the 19th century because there was nothing in the way. And now it's prohibitively expensive to get all those overhead cables and wires moved or cleared temporarily. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone. Uh, Tom. Thank you. I just had a quick question. I was, um... Jan, I was listening to your the the flow of sequence and, and everything made sense. And I just had a question, and it's more general and it's maybe my own naivete, but um the first thing you said was somebody submits for a building permit, right? And that's where the, the process begins, right? Essentially. Well, the first thing I said was they apply for demolition, they make an application for demolition. It may or may not be simultaneous with the building permit, depending on what they know. Okay. So my, my question is, uh, is there a sense of a, a scale of things that one needs to know about whether or not they can be demolished or not? So I have a small shed in my yard. Uh, can I just disassemble that if I wanted to, or do I need a permit to do that? Or, and I guess I'm just curious, like, do you homeowners know that they need to see you before they take something down in their own backyard. And I guess, are there projects well, you won't have purview over because people aren't aware, aware of that. So I'm wondering what the triggers are or what, what that process looks like kind of a little bit before that, like what's the awareness in that world and what are the, what are the rules around um, demolition, not so much building. Um, well, Jane, feel free to jump in, but um, a lot of people don't know that it, if it's older than 50 years, if it's visible from the street, if it's in a historic district or anything like that, that it would come to us, that it won't, they won't automatically just get a permit. A lot of people don't know they need a permit. Um, right. But that we want to do more um, press about this. We'd like to, once we get this bylaw, we were hoping to use it as a yeah. trigger to put some articles in the paper, you know, saying, did you know your barn is an important resource and we can help you save it? Or yeah. you know, did you know that the look of your house contributes to you know, the viability of Amherst as a tourist destination or something like that? People don't necessarily think about that, but we would then have these rules 
um, these these you know breaking points listed for people to see and and hopefully it would lead to appreciation of the community as well as maybe oh maybe I can't just tear down my shed without asking since it was built in 1920 and it's an absolutely gem of a little structure yeah okay yeah I mean I'm just I was just curious about process and awareness and that, so I mean that sounds like a brilliant strategy and and um, super helpful thank you you know, in an ideal situation, we could we could get inventoried and listed buildings onto property cards, um, and that would be a that would be I think really really ideal and useful. the yes, The yes. awareness question is a lot like um, you know, mm -hmm. do people know that they need a permit to build a fence, or do they know they need a right. permit to um, cut down a bunch right. of trees? And you know. Right. It's, or replace their chimney on any house. Yeah. People don't know. I didn't know that. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, right. I agree. And and I do, but I do think that the um, the project you described of um, putting together this database and and mapping out these structures and and making people aware um, ahead of time is is I think a really thoughtful way of approaching this. Not that people are presented with surprises and that, that feel like roadblocks. And so I feel like, you know, finding ways to get ahead of that is changes, you know, as you're changing the language of this from demolition to preservation, I think getting ahead of it also changes the tone of this from being a roadblock to something to celebrate. And I think um, that's a useful project that um, <laughs> I think should should be front front loaded somehow and uh, <laughs> get get done soon. Thank you. I like the way you shape it. You can help us write the articles. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, Janet. So I went through this with a, um, I've come through this several times. And so I have a, some very nitpicky, very specific corrections or points where I don't understand what something's happening. I don't really feel, I, I don't wanna pull the whole planning board through it, but sometimes a few times there's like saying C section F and you go there and it's not the right site yeah, yeah. or it, do, it doesn't exist. And so, um, so, those kind of corrections, I would like to sit down with maybe Ben or somebody and just go through. Um, but I also had other questions, like I was confused about like decision points, like, you know, if the historic commission is meeting and they find the building to be um, preferably preserved, is that the day of the decision or is it when they file, when they send their written decision to the applicant? Like what's the trigger date for the appeal? And so the questions about timing, you know, whether the building commissioner gets written notice, um, how you notify the public, not just the abutters, you know, how can the town alert more people that, you know, you're having your hearing. Um, so I have a lot of things like that. And I don't know, I don't want to do that for the next 30 minutes, but it's kind of what I do as an attorney is that kind of very specific language, or sometimes there were sentences or clauses that just didn't seem to belong there or confusing. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to offer that kind of level of detailed analysis without burdening the entire group here. But I do have like, so I'm not sure what to, how to do that. That's my first issue. My second issue is I do have sort of broader comments um, that might be useful. And I know, is it more useful for me to send them to the historic commission or to Ben or um, I mean, I'm trying to, um, you know, I, I thought you should add streetscapes and neighborhoods to the purposes section, which is in the model bylaw for the Mass Historical Commission, things like that. Is that, I mean, how would, how can I get you that information or comments usefully? Is it useful now or? Uh, ben, do you wanna? Yeah, I was just gonna say, thanks, Janet. We, uh, yeah, I do apologize. We found a, a, a number of mistakes in terms of how sections are referenced. And I, it just, we were, uh, because we're adjusting to the new general bylaw format, I kept on having to change the, uh, the way sections were referenced and numbered. So um, we, we've, we have also found a lot of those mistakes. So I do apologize if that um, made it hard to understand. Um, so I think, you know, we're happy to uh, have you send us those inline comments or meet with us separately, but I'm um, certainly interested in some of your broader uh, comments and questions, I guess is how I would. So 
here's my big three broad ones. Yeah. I like I like the old purposes section. I thought that like that had like so specific and covered so much. And I thought it was a very positive thing. So I've always it's kind of my personal favorite and I would stick with it. Um, I thought you should keep the historic commission as the entity to decide what's significant. And then in an administrative section, allow yourself to delegate that to one of your members and a planning board staff member. Um, Cause someday you may not want to do it that way. And that would give you the um, ability to go back and forth. Um, it also said the language was, you know, a historic commission member and planning staff, which sounded like a huge group. And so that was a little unclear, but I just, I thought that the, the administrative section from the mass um, historic commission um, model bylaw was super useful and you could give yourself some fluidity or ability to sort of change who the decision makers are if you know you change that um and then i thought that i did think the public needs some way to get rid notification it could be on the town scrawl on the town web page um and then i also wondered about um timing issue like i know chris skelly was talking about the need to you know for some a lot of commissions like to uh, um, hire independent consultants to determine what's what should be preferably preserved. And I wondered if there was enough time to do that, or is that the habit of the commission to, to consult an expert? It seems like the Valley is full of experts. They're all down the road in Deerfield. Um, but is there enough time to have that kind of consultation? So I had timing questions too. All right. Uh any of the panelists want to respond to that or just take those under advisement? Jane, you are muted. Thank you. Um, there, there are a number of comments and questions there and I think uh, it would be really helpful to, for you to share those with, with Ben and then with the commission and we, we, we will we'll certainly look at them and look at the best the best way to prepare the bylaw. I will take yeah, it neatly. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate your looking at things in detail. I just have to say one thing is be sure you're looking at the most recent version because okay. you said streetscapes and neighborhoods was out of the purpose. It's in the first line. Uh, it may be that you're seeing an older, I know you've seen this a number of times and we've revised it over and over, but it, it is there. So just, just okay. be sure. Okay, okay. thanks. All right, thanks, Janet. Um, Johanna. Last question, I promise. Um, I was just curious whether homeowners or the owners of historic structures or those purchasing in a historic district are notified of that at the point of sale, just as part of the closing documents. Um, so in the historic district, which there, you know, there's two historic districts in town, we send a newsletter um, every year uh, to residents there. Um, so that's, we try to notify folks um, at least once a year um, in the historic districts, but there's, for the historic structures scattered throughout all of Amherst, um, that there, we, we don't have a system of notif notification at this point. But real estate agents will not tell you. They don't want to tell you. So we can't count on them. Right. Okay. Um, I don't see any more board hands. I see one hand in the attendees. Uh, and we've just passed eight o'clock when we usually take a break. So. I'm wondering whether we just listen to the public comment that we have and uh, and then uh, have a short discussion about whether we're sort of finished with this item on the agenda or whether we want to continue after the break. All right, Kitty, Kitty Axelson Berry, uh, why don't we move her into the panelists so that she can make her public comment. Kitty, you are still muted. Kitty Axelson Berry, are you there? Doug, there could be a legacy hand from her hand being up before. Yep. All right. Um, in that case, uh, why don't we move her back to the attendees and I'll, 
we can take down that hand. Um, and uh, we'll take a five minute break. I see right now it's 8.09. Actually, before we do that, let's just have a quick conversation. Do people wanna continue this, uh, this discussion on this bylaw after the break or not? Um, can I see, just raise your hand if you want to continue the conversation. Not seeing any. Okay, so panelists uh, from the Historic Commission and Ben, are there any other things you want to say to us before we conclude this discussion? No, I just want to thank you again for uh, your attention to the to the draft bylaw and for um, you know really appreciate your recognition that we've continued to work on it with uh, feedback from a from a previous visit with you and um, uh, appreciate all your comments this evening and. Um, uh, it, we will continue to, to fashion this and, and shape it uh, as can best serve the town of Amherst. And so Janet will appreciate getting your, uh, getting your questions and, and comments also. All right, so Thanks, thank Jane. you all. Chris, I see your hand. I just have a question for the board, um, which is, um, would you like to see this again before it goes to town council? Because um, what, the normal course of events would be that the historical commission and the planning department would um, send it to the town manager to bring to town council and then it would be referred back to the planning board and the CRC um, for public hearings. So do you want to see this again before it goes through that process? And, you know, it sounds like Janet had a number of things that she was suggesting that may we may want to incorporate and you know, give you another draft to review before it goes to town council. So is that something that you want to do or not? I'm seeing Janet shaking her head yes, I believe. Anybody else want to indicate? Or is that, is, is that sufficient that we'll bring it back? All right. Uh, Johanna had a thumbs up on that. Tom, you have your hand raised. Yeah, it's just a quick. So, it, in in Christine's outline, it's going to come back to us eventually, right? Is that it's just going to go through um, through council and CRC. Council. Okay. Well, it yeah, would no, come back I'm, to you. I just wanted to point this out because last year we had some complaints about things going to town council before people on the planning board felt they were ready to go to town council. So right. I'm trying to make it more, you know, possible to have all of your things incorporated before it goes to town council. So that's why I'm asking this question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Johanna? I think it makes sense to keep it at the planning board for a little bit longer before it goes to town council so that ideally we send them as close to a finished product as possible. It's good. Okay. And why don't yeah, we agree with that plan to do that? All right. Thanks panelists. And uh, we'll take a five minute break and we'll move on to something else uh, when we return. The time now is 8 12. Uh, please try to be back at 8 17 and uh, turn off your video and mute your microphone while you're gone. Thank you. Thanks, Emma.
All right, it's 817. Doug, may I ask a question? Sure, Chris. I have this funny remembrance in the back of my mind that Andrew may have said something at the last meeting that he was going to miss this meeting. Did anyone remember that? I, I was looking through my notes, but I don't, I don't see a reference to that, but he's usually, you know, yeah. he usually lets us know if he's going to be here or not. Does anyone remember him saying he wasn't going to be here? No. I don't remember. That was, that was a long enough meeting that I was pretty well fried by the end of it. Okay. But regardless of whether he told us, he is not present. <laughs> All right. So I have... am finishing up dinner, so I'm going to turn off my video for a little bit. All right. Thank you. And once we see that Jack's back paying attention, we'll resume. Hey, Jack, Jemsek, are you back? So Chris, uh, is it allowed for us to continue? I mean, we've certainly had people that have had to leave a meeting and go on to other things, so. We'll note when Jack returns, how's that? Okay, all right, so uh, why don't we resume? The time is 8.20 and uh, we're moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is item four. Uh, and uh, this concerns uh, the drafting of a, a zoning amendment on large scale solar installations, discussion by the board. Um, so Chris, do you wanna give, maybe give us an update on the conversations uh, in town hall and other mm -hmm. places about where this stands with your process? 
Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So there's a plan being developed for working on the solar bylaw and the solar site assessment. The plan is being coordinated with the town manager, Paul Bachelman, and assistant town manager, Dave Zomek. And so far the plan is as follows. The solar site assessment um, will be um, kind of managed by Stephanie Chicor Chicorello. Uh, She's the assistant. Yeah. Jack is Jack has joined us. It's 821. Jack. 821. Okay. Jack so we'll, is back. Right. Sorry to sorry to interrupt you, Chris. That's okay. So anyway, um, so the plan is as follows. Um, the solar site assessment is going to be managed by Stephanie Ciccarello, who's the sustainability coordinator. And she's also the um, staff liaison to ECAC, which I always forget what that means, but I think it means energy and climate action committee. Mm -hmm. um, so she is currently developing an RFP to hire a consultant to work with the town uh, on producing the solar site assessment. And um, that will look at land in Amherst to determine the best areas of town to site solar installations and where we do not want to site solar installations. The study will be based on numerous criteria, which will be developed by the town, by the public, and by the consultant in concert. Um, the study will aid the town in creating a map of areas of town where we want solar and where we don't want it. Um, we're hoping that it will result in a map in the form of an overlay district that can be incorporated into the zoning bylaw. Um, and then in terms of the solar bylaw, we um, currently are uh, planning for the planning board and the planning department to work on the solar bylaw, which is the way it really should be, um, informed by the work on the solar site assessment. Um, so um, the planning board members have been reading solar bylaws from other towns and they've been given PVPC's solar best practices guide. Um, the planning department will be drafting the solar bylaw and bringing it to the planning board for review and comment. And all of the planning board meetings are public meetings. So the public will be kept aware of where the planning board is with the solar bylaw. Um, the planning department staff is gonna be interacting. You know, We interact on a daily or at least a weekly basis with Stephanie and her uh, contacts with um, ECAC. Um, in addition to that, um, Chris, me, and Stephanie are working on developing a charge for a working group uh, to make recommendations to the town manager. So this would be a group that would be appointed by the town manager, and maybe it would have five to seven members. And this group would be mainly overseeing the site, the, the solar site assessment. Um, and it, it would also advise the town and the staff and the planning board on the solar bylaw. And we're thinking that the working group would have people on it who are very familiar with solar installations, but also familiar with um, some of the issues that are related to siting solar installations. So there are people over at UMass who are developing a me methodology for um, municipalities and how to deal with solar installations. And we're hoping that some of them can, or at least one of them can be part of this group. Um, so that working group would work in coordination with ECAC and the planning board and the planning department, and will seek public input as the project moves forward. Um, we're envisioning that there will be several public meetings or public forums in which members of the public will be invited to give their input and to comment on the bylaw and the solar assessment as we proceed. And the aim is to finish this work um, in advance of May 2023. Um, if the moratorium goes through, um, May of 2023 is the date on which um, the moratorium would expire. Um, so we would hope to finish well in advance of that, but I can't really predict how long it will take to do the solar assessment. I can kind of predict how long it will take to do the solar um, zoning bylaw amendment based on last year's experiences, but uh, hopefully it won't take 15 months. So that is my um, update. And um, I understand that uh, Doug prepared um, a, a chart that he may want to talk about that compares um, 
what various towns and cities are doing with regard to solar bylaws. And I thought maybe we could use this time um, after you all make comments and ask questions, but I would be interested in knowing um, the kinds of things that the planning board members are thinking about and that you would like to see included in a solar bylaw. Now, obviously this is a first conversation and you'll have time you know, in the future to add to your uh, comments, but I, you know, starting off writing this solar bylaw, I'm very interested in, in getting your input because I assume you've read some of the material that we've sent out. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, board members, anybody want to start off with thoughts? Uh, do you want me to share my screen and show that chart I put together? Um, I'm seeing one. Okay, well, um, I know Chris sent it to everyone. It didn't make it into the packet. Um, Chris, is it reasonable to assume that you or Pam can add it to the packet when the packet is posted? Uh, just so that the public has access to a copy. I may have already done that. I just okay. can't remember. All right, but good. Yes, All right. you can make sure. So why don't I share my screen? Um, let's see. Well, let me know how this. I believe I have it too, Doug. Oh, do you? So why don't you go so. ahead and do that? Pam? You want me to try? Sure. Right. I think that might be better. But I can't remember as whether it was a um, it was an Excel document. It was an Excel document. Oops. Not Can a PDF. Not, not a PDF. But isn't this it? Solar bylaw comparison. Can you yes. see it? Yep, that's right. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right. So, um, you know, as I started looking through these, uh, it seemed like several of the towns around us had very similar bylaws and probably used the same uh, sort of somebody did it first and then the other ones kind of adopted it and made their own changes. Um, I was mostly interested in characteristics that were not directly related to the geography of the of the site. Uh, so it, I think I was thinking sort of in parallel with what Chris has described that, you know, we these are the kinds of things we will want to talk about and um, certainly get input from the working group. But these are things that we have more probably have more input on than the extent of the overlay district. Um, so I looked at the, um, you know, just, just some of the physical characteristics and uh, uh, parameters that towns were putting on, on solar installations. Um, and you can see across the top, I looked at the DOER template, and then at Belchertown, Hadley, Pelham, and Shutesbury's uh, bylaws. Um, so just going down the characteristics on the left, um, I just put the section in there so that I could find the solar section when I came back to it. Um, Belchertown was unique in that they were limiting the area of installations to 20 acres, and that was the fenced area. Um, and they didn't want to see forest clearing that was in excess of 10 acres. Um, Pelham and Shutesbury created, had a, had a map that created these solar districts. So they took their town and divided it into different districts. And then they indicated that, you know, maybe within each district, there was only one solar array allowed. So whatever owner got their, got their installation first, uh, Nobody else within that district was able to do it. Um, then uh, setbacks, uh, you know, I think that's going to be a prime area of conversation for us. And you know, just as we've done with other zoning districts and uses, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of conversation about that. So 
you can see that the DOE R template, which it, I can't remember, it might have just been sort of a, you know, why don't you just threw a number in? I don't think they really thought a lot about what they put in, but they had small setbacks. Uh, the next smallest was Hadley, um, and then uh, Belchertown, and then Pelham and Shutesbury had very large setbacks. And um, then, then there were special considerations for setbacks in particularly uh, scenic parts of town, like in Hadley, where along Route 147, that was one of their scenic byways. Uh, so they had a, a greater setback. Um, and then I think the other towns all had these other dimensions if the solar array was abutting conservation or, rec or residential uh, land. Uh, I looked at the signage and, you know, I don't think there's very much variation there. Uh, visual distraction, Belchertown called out glare um, and, and if, if, and didn't want to see a solar array obstructing people's uh, view on, a, uh, you know, around a corner on a road, for instance. Um, so that we might have some conversation about that. Um, Pelham and Shutesbury wanted to see the fencing be black in color uh, so that it recedes into the landscape. Um, everybody wanted their utility connections underground to the extent it was you know, reasonable to require that. And that would obviously have some interpretation. Um, three out of four of the towns uh, wanted to see 30 feet deep uh, vegetative screening where they decided that it needed to happen. Um, no, three out of four did not want to have herbicides used uh, on plant control with, at the array. Um, three out of four had these, this forest mitigation criteria that if, if you say you, you, your array was 10 acres, you needed to have another 40 acres that you set aside uh, and did not agreed to leave intact as woodland. Um, and then they all had the, the surety requirement uh, for, to make sure there was money to remove the array at the end of the useful life, um, you know, and which kind of was part of it being a, a temporary installation in, in the end. So that's, that's really all I did. Uh, much of the rest of these bylaws were very similar. Um, I would think the planning staff could practically pick any one of them and use that as a template. Because um, uh, I didn't think there was a lot of other controversial stuff. But uh, I'm sure we'll find other things that we can argue about. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, you know, we can leave it on, this on the screen if you want. But uh, Tom, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, th and thanks for this work. I didn't realize that you had gone through the trouble of, of doing this, which m seems a bit laborious and, and I appreciate it. Because um, my comment was that I think this really reflects um, that what we're seeing is some version of a template that is being constructed and reconstructed then varied based on specific interests and conditions of the community around it, right? And so Chris asked, you know, what would we like to see? And my thought was, you know, I think we're going to see 90% of this be pretty boilerplate. Um, what, I, what I'm most interested in is how do we deviate from that and then a rationale as to why, you know, similar to the way we were talking about making changes from the old bylaw to a new, here's the rationale why we do that. I think if we can start with this boilerplate and get something really, you know, moving, we can then really focus on some of the more hot button issues, Doug, that I think we want to, we want to touch on about, um, you know, making sure we're dealing with issues of conservation and these notions of, are about forest clearing and, um, you know, even setbacks and safety and, uh, you know, water conservation, you know, or protection and all that stuff. I think those are going to be the kind of 
things we really need to focus on and have a rationale as to why we why we want to deviate from any one of these particular sort of best practices that seem to be presented here. So that was, you know, I think Chris was asking what do we want to see. I think that's the way I feel about it, that if we can get started with this really rough roadmap and then talk about how we deviate from that for to, to meet amorous needs and, and the needs of our community. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Did you have a comment about that? Yeah, I just wanted to say, and I think I might have sent you some of these documents, um, but perhaps not. Um, there are issues of um, what the values of your community are. And that's one thing that the working group is going to try to work on. Um, and the values are things like you know, we have a climate action plan and we want to meet our climate action plan by X date. And so what do we need to do to, you know, achieve that goal? Or, you know, we have a value of seeing beautiful scenes from the roadways. And are we disturbed by seeing solar arrays from the roadways, such as like Hampshire College's solar array on Bay Road? Um, you know, is that something that people want to see? Hampshire College likes to have it front and center because they're proud of it. They feel like this is a really good thing that they did. Other people won't um, view it that way. So we need to have a community discussion about these things. We need to, you know, talk about um, the value of, you know, water and groundwater and stormwater and all of these things and how do we control it and how do we keep it from you know damaging any of our resources and so you know one of the one of the documents that the um what was it i think it was the town council or maybe it was the crc was looking at was um a, a kind of a five-part um, process to work through some of this. And the first part of the process was setting up what are your community values that you want to work towards. So I think that's an important piece. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, uh, Janet. Um, I wanna piggyback on everyone's comments. Um, um, I definitely think that it's great to work off a template um, I'm not sure that these, you know, four or five towns would be the template. I mean, obviously they have lots of different factors that we're going to need to consider. Um, you know, so, you know, I always, you know, I always think like what, what are the best practices or, you know, what are the issues we want to cover, which is what Christine was just talking about. And I actually, I, I didn't read every page of the very, very long AFAL document that you sent us, Doug. I appreciate this comparison chart because it's super clear. I thought the AFAL um, report and you know bylaw and process, which I think they did with Tufts, was a great template because it is kind of walking you through your values and saying you could do this or you could do that or here's some language if you want to do this. And I, I actually thought that would be a really good template to start working off of like, what do you want to protect? Where do you, you know, where's your preference for where you want to cite things? Um, and so, you know, I just, I just thought that Athol example was an example of good process, but also sort of opening up the whole discussion of different bylaw. Um, you know, I mean, they had language, but they also kind of said you could say this or you could say that. And going working through that bylaw or using that as a template process would be really instructive because. We're going to wind. You know, Athol was concerned about scenic views a lot. We're going to be concerned maybe about you know freshwater wetlands, things like that. But wouldn't you consider that a template for a solar study rather than a template for a bylaw? They, but if towards the back of that huge document, they did have bylaws. They uh -huh. had bylaw language. Yeah, yeah. I, so I thought that was a great document, and I did. I read through it. You know, it's been several weeks ago now, but um, it did seem like it got at a lot of the decisions and, and values that we would probably want to talk about. And I think we're sort of confronted with how do you write a bylaw as you're doing this values process of the solar assessment, you know? And so, you know, maybe we can use that as a skeleton and, you know, be thinking about language. You know, one of the things I'm really interested in is can we have solar on farm, farmland and still use the farmland for grazing or growing crops. Like that would be my preference. And so I, I did some research in that and people are doing that. And so that might be in our bylaw saying, 
yeah, they have to be high enough or far enough apart that you could, you know, actually gra raise crops or, you know, graze, grazing animals a little easier as long as they're short. You know, that kind, those kind of things I think we could add in, but you're only going to add it in if you want to add it in. Well, I guess the other that raises another topic that's sort of in the back of my mind, which is the, the state legislation that has uh, basically says you can't have any any un, un, you know you really can't do very much to limit where solar installations go unless it's for public safety, health, and welfare or something like that. And so, you know, some of these provisions in these adjacent towns, you know, strike me as maybe not even ho holding up to a lawsuit. Um, you know, and, and I guess, so that's one question. And then, um, you know, for some of these towns where you've got four times the, the land required to be set aside, there's an economic uh, implication to that. And so in a way we're, we're setting up the parameters of the next generation of public utility. And how much do we wanna be spending on electricity? And, you know, is that, uh, is, the, is that amount of, of charge or, you know, societal resource to generate electricity affordable to the poorest among us. And so there's a social justice aspect to it. So, I mean, this seems like a really kind of a big question and I'm not sure where we have all the expertise to do it, but I hope our consultants can help us. So uh, let's see, Chris, I see your hand. So one of the big things I think we need to think about is what is going to be the tone of our bylaw? Is it going to be a tone of welcoming um, solar arrays and installations and trying to figure out the best place to put them and how to deal with them? Or is it going to be kind of a punitive or, you know, exclusionary or, you know, we don't want you here, but if you have to come here, this is what you have to do. And I think you know, we have to talk about that attitude because I think, you know, there will be people who will push us in the direction of the punitive and the, you know, you know, highly restrictive. And I think, you know, based on our climate action goals, that's not really a direction that we should be moving in. So this is, you know, we need to have this conversation out in the open and, and resolve at least what the planning board thinks about this. And hopefully we can also, you know, hear from the public and try to resolve what Amherst thinks about it. Great, uh, Johanna. Doug, I really appreciate you sifting through the different bylaws and coming up with this comparison. The one data point that I keep pining for, and maybe I'll do this myself, is looking at the current bylaw that we have that guides energy siting in Amherst and just seeing how it stacks up to these. Um, Cause let's say we do nothing. That would be kind of the baseline right. that we're operating right. from. And it would be interesting to see how it stacks up. Yep. Well, I think, um, I, I mean, I actually thought about putting a column in for what we have now, but I realized that, I mean, I didn't get very far into that. I did this fairly quickly um, and some of these, you know, may not be quite perfect. And, you know, I may have been moving too fast, but um, it struck me that, you know, we have different setbacks, for instance, required in different districts already in town. And the solar installations are allowed in multiple districts. So uh, there isn't one set of setbacks, for instance, that applies to a solar array. Um, and in fact, I, I guess I'm not even clear on whether a setback intended for a building structure would even apply to a setback for a solar frame or panel. Um, you know, so I didn't get very far with that. And, um, you know, I, I also thought I did go back and look at what, what uh, Chris and the staff answered when we asked what the Zoning Board of, of Appeals has required on the arrays that have been put in town so far. 
Um, and I, I don't think I saw any uniform setbacks in that response. So, you know, um, I'm happy to share my document with you and you can add a few more columns to it, Johanna. Um, do, I think we could take this off the screen. Uh, I think we could, um, you know, I, I hope everybody's got it and, um, you know, we can add to it or whatever as we see fit. Chris? I just wanted to say that we do adhere to the dimensional requirements of the zoning bylaw and we consider that the solar arrays are structures. So okay. we require that whatever setback is required in the particular zoning district. But at the same time, we hear from residents and you know abutters about what their concerns are. And if they think that the setback needs to be greater than the zoning board or the planning board would hear that and then make a determination based on that. So they don't necessarily strictly stick to the setbacks, but at least they have sort of a benchmark to start start with. Okay, great. Um, other other comments. Okay, well then I, I guess Chris, you had asked about the tone that we want to take. And I, at least, my inclination would be to be uh, as welcoming as we could be. I, I think we have a lot of ground to, to make up. Uh, you know, it's been 30 years since, we, since I first heard about uh, climate change and global warming. And uh, it just feels like we're finally getting traction on, on the technology uh, being feasible enough and enough people being worried and motivated to do something about it that, gee, we're finally getting some action and that's good. So, um, you know, hopefully it's not already too late um, since uh, the climate we're living in today is probably based on the carbon uh, count from 15, 20 years ago. You know, if we did nothing, if we emit no more carbon, it's still gonna get hotter for a while. Um, so, um, but I'll try to be optimistic about all of this. Um, so I'd be as welcoming as we could be and, and only, only exclude solar installations where public health, you know, safety and welfare are clearly uh, at stake. So things like water resources uh, would be, you know, a prime example of where I'd be very careful about what we're doing. Um, but I'm personally less worried about the view, uh, you know, uh, and I think the economics is something we need to think about, or at least be aware of, even if we don't have really very good information. Um, personally, um, you know, I, I put solar on my house and I saw how much that cost. And and so I do think that there's a, an efficiency from having fewer larger arrays rather than all of us putting $25,000 worth of solar work on our roofs. Um, but I recognize that every little bit helps. So, but I, do, I don't know that that's a very efficient way to, to meet our need. And I don't even know if there's enough roofs to do that. And hopefully the solar study will help us understand that. Um, so that's, that's probably my two cents for the moment. Uh, Jack, I see your hand. Yeah, I just I mean you mentioned water resources. Uh, the Water Supply Protection Committee met last week. And we are going to you know, do a little bit of uh, do a white paper. Um, Myself and, and Brian Yellen and you know maybe others uh, will be looking at the impact of solar on you know water resource uh, aspects. But you know my my personal experience has been that the the solar rays do not bring on hazardous materials. That's you know the number one concern. Uh, you know with regard to leaching and things like that. You know and I think we all are understanding how important the construction phase of these are. So for me, you know, having, you know, a very strong uh, stormwater, you know, pollution prevention plan is important. And, you know, that I really like the idea of that third party inspector 
uh, being there as being someone independent, uh, making sure that the, you know, the, the, the SWIP, uh, as we call it, is properly implemented, because that's the most um, you know, critical phase of the whole operation. Subsequent to it, and, you know, the installation of a, a solar field, you're, you're, whether it be you know, within a forested or an agricultural area, it's a grassland, basically. You know, it's not a paved area. It's panels above soil and, and grass. So it maintains a grassland sort of uh, environment with, you know, from a hydrologic, uh, hydro, you know, hydrology perspective. But um, certainly the construction phase is the most critical. And, um, but, you know, I, I think the, the water resources thing is, is something that has kind of got bit blown out of proportion. Um, and again, I, I just looking at your chart, one more thing. I, I, I feel like, you know, Pelham and Shootsbury are a little bit of, you know, outliers <laughs> with regard to the offset, the 500 foot offset there seems uh, a little bit uh, untenable, uh, especially, you know, compared to the DOER and, and uh, you know, what other towns have been doing. So I'm wondering, I'm not sure we would want to, you know, focus too much on those, on those two bylaws. So thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, Johanna, I'm going to call on you next, but uh, I want to, since Jack mentioned the, the, t the towns that he wasn't sure we should follow, particularly uh, Janet mentioned she, she wasn't sure those were the towns we wanted to follow uh, and did mention the Athol study. But, um, you know, I think it might be good for all of us to think about, you know, taking a few minutes and looking at other towns. You know, I haven't looked at Northampton. I haven't looked at Newton. I haven't looked at Arlington. Um, you know, all of which are much more developed. Um, so, you know, if they don't put it on roofs, uh, they've got they've got a problem. So, um, you know, I don't know what Lennox has. <laughs> uh, so maybe we need to find some other relatively affluent towns with lots of open, undeveloped land, um, and and look at them. Um, I guess one other thing that just occurs to me is that we have a high percentage of our land that the town has purchased and put into conservation land. And so there might, you know, we could either decide to just completely exclude solar from all of our conservation land, uh, or we could say, well, we can do that in some areas where they're not highly sensitive habitats. Um, so I think that's one conversation that whether, you know, somehow we need to get, get at that too, because uh, when I looked at the map that uh, Cinda Jones sent uh, that showed how her properties related to the, develop, the developed land in Amherst um, and, and the conservation land, you know, it was, it was pretty striking how much conservation land there is so if you take that away and you take all the developed land away, you're not left with very much. Um, and um, so I'll stop there. Uh, Johanna. Thanks, Doug. Um, I'm appreciating you sharing all your thoughts. Um, I agree with you that I think we need to be welcoming of solar rather than punitive. That needs to be the tone of this. Um, I do think rooftop solar has a special role to play. It's unlikely to meet all of our energy needs in town, but there are benefits to producing solar close to where you need it that are very real. And the avoided transmission costs, the lost leakage of power during transmission, and, um, and then they're just like resiliency benefits too. I mean, we haven't had a lot of blackouts and extreme weather events here, but I know in places like Puerto Rico and wildfire ravaged California, people are really looking to rooftop solar coupled with energy storage as a way to, uh, you know, maintain power um, in a more and more unstable world. Um, and then even like 
connecting those with microgrids so that like one neighborhood that loses power can share or that doesn't lose power can share power, you know, with other neighbors. Um, I don't think our bylaw is going to accomplish all of that, but I, I do think, um, I mean, Amherst has a history of supporting rooftop solar with the various solarized programs. I'm honestly not up to speed on where our community solar program is at. Um, but um, but I, I do think we should be encouraging rooftop solar as much as we can on the local level. Um, and then I, I do think that there, I'm, I'd be interested to hear well, I guess from folks in the solar industry about how much town by town variations in the bylaws affect their ability to, I don't know, do, do business efficiently <laughs> um, and how important it is to kind of try to streamline that on a regional level um, mm -hmm. or whether, you know, we should like, who cares what Hadley's doing? Let's just figure out what we think is best and do that. Um, and then I'm also, I don't know, I mean, I guess this is probably a function of needing to build the bicycle while we're riding it when it comes to the clean energy transition. But I am struck by the overall lack of guidance from, I don't know, uh, PVPA or, uh, you know, some of the almost countywide entities. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was ice skating with somebody who's a planner for Franklin County. And she said, towns are constantly call, coming to her saying, you know, what sh how should we do solar? And they don't have the resources to offer coherent guidance. And so, you know, it would just be, we're, we're gonna need that. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, before I call on you, Jack, uh, Johanna, since you mentioned residential areas, um, you know, it, it had it also occurred to me that at least based on my experience with the size of the array on my roof and um, how much of my energy that generates, um, there is some sort of ratio between, you know, how many houses an acre of solar arrays would support. And, you know, it might, let's say it's 25 houses. So, you know, if we went out into some of the larger subdivisions in, the, in town, uh, I forget the name of them, but, uh, you know, would we be okay with every 25 one acre lots, we'd be okay with a one acre solar array. And that, you know, then that community has, its, has done its part, uh, you know, could be isolated from the rest of the town and, you know, if there's a battery, then they probably could generate a sizable proportion of their of their energy. Um, so I'm not sure I really, you know, the more I've thought about it, I'm not sure I really want to exclude solar from residential areas. Um, and another another kind of uh, thought was we have high tension lines that run through Amherst right now, and a, a pretty sizable part of that uh, route is owned by Western Mass Electric. It's about 150 feet wide. And, you know, maybe we ought to be talking to Wamiko about putting solar arrays under their high tension lines. Um, you know, I don't know if they've thought about it, but, you know, we should be pushing them to think about it. Um, but that's some of that cuts right through residential areas. Would we be okay with that? We've got people living next to high tension lines now, and they knew that when they bought it. So, um, Johanna, I assume you're done, and I'll you'll take your hand down when you're when you're finished. Jack, you're next. Yeah, Doug. I, what a great idea with regard to the uh, transmission line and and the, just. You know, the right of way, it's there. They had to keep vegetation down as it is. So it requires maintenance, you know, oh, very good idea. And I'm wondering, you know, if, if your original thought there, uh, you should get credit for it. <laughs> but 
no, that 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 is very good. I was going to say that when when the Mass Massachusetts came out with their, uh, you know, incentives for developing uh, uh, solar, uh, they knew they they, they didn't want to they didn't want to get forced. They didn't want to take up agricultural land, and they prioritized brownfields number one, which included landfills, uh, to the extent where they were giving thirty percent like credit. Uh, for those types of things. And that, that was a make or break thing in terms of getting uh, credits from the state, uh, you know, for those, for those areas. And, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that those areas are, are extremely limited. And so, you know, we're not gonna meet our objectives. I think we, uh, you know, I see Steve Roof is, is a participant here, but I, I think, you know, we need a, you know, 200, 300 acres of, of additional solar to meet the, the the goals, so that's just not going to happen, you know, in parking lots and rooftop and things like that. So we have to, you know, utilize, you know, what we have, and 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 you know, and and I think there's some controversy with regard to forest versus solar. Which, which one has, you know, the, the 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 lower carbon footprint? You know, I think Steve Roof would say that. You know, most definitely, you know, solar is going to, you know, come out on the uh, positive side uh, versus the uh, forest. And and again, we're, you know, we're looking at you know ten or twenty acre uh, developments here. But I just wanted to say that that's why there's pressure on additional, um, you know, on, on this development on areas that are you know considered like, you know, natural resource areas and they're not protected necessarily, but you kind of have to venture into, you know, areas that we see when we're driving outside of Amherst, you know, farmlands and, and, and forests that have been cut. So that's why that's happening. You know, it, it's, there's the need and it's just, um, it's, it's where solar developers have to go to because there aren't any alternatives, feasible alternatives. All right, thanks, Jack. Um, Chris, um, Johanna had mentioned, gee, it would be interesting to know, to hear from some solar developers about some of the economics and, and the obstacles that different towns uh, present. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, there is that developer that had proposed the project uh, on Shutesbury Road um, that we could probably track down. Um, and then there's people like PB Squared who are local suppliers. And I don't know what their experience is with ground mounted installation, but I wonder whether we wanna start to reach out to people who might bring a particular perspective, uh, you know, and, you know, I mean, a wide variety of perspectives. Um, and whether it's proper for us to do that or whether it's something the working group would be doing or would it be part of the solar study? Um, so I guess we don't need to decide that tonight, but uh, you know, I think it's something to think about is how, how do we gain some of the perspective of people who are quite knowledgeable and you know, some of them will not agree with, you know, a lot of people in town, and but we're we're kind of building a new thing here. Um, Chris, I see your hand. So that was one of the ideas that Stephanie and I had for the working group that we might bring in. I think there are two people that we are we know about, um, and one is that um, attorney who wrote the article in the Gazette a, a month or so ago. Sarah Matthews. Um, yeah, and she's she works for uh, developers of solar arrays, and and she might you know bring a a good perspective. I think she lives in Amherst, mm -hmm. and there's another person who is um, involved in solar development, whom Stephanie knows about, and and we were thinking of contacting those two people and seeing if they would be interested in being part of the working group because that's knowledge that you know, we don't have and forest ecologists don't have and groundwater people don't have. And, you know, we need to know this because it relates to how 
close these things need to be to the grid and do they need battery storage and where does the battery storage go does it go in the middle or does it go on the road or all these different things that we don't know anything about but people who are involved in the developments do know about so i think that's a good idea to bring those people in and you know we can talk about whether the planning board would like to have them one or two of them come and um and talk to the planning board about things from that um, perspective so yeah, it's certainly on our radar screen. Yep. Okay, good. I mean, we don't want to demand so much time from them to talk to a lot of different bodies. Mm -hmm. So you know, if if the right place for them to make their contribution is the working group, um, I, I'm not sure I would personally in, insist that they came to us. But um, I'd certainly want to know that there was a wide variety of representation in what the working group brought to us. Uh, Janet, you're next. Um, just reaching back to something you said earlier about the um, standard, you know, the state, you know, the, the regulations have to be reasonable. And, um, you know, you can have regulations that promote the public health and safety. Those are really um, squishy. And so that pretty much, I think it gives us free reign to do what we want as long as it's not really out there. Because the public welfare is obviously a very general con you know, concept. And, you know, there's lots of, you know, positives to scenic views or environmental stuff or, you know, open fields for children to run into, you know, things like that. So you could pretty much, as long as you have a reasonable basis for it, and it makes sense to most people, you're going to get through. Um, we seem like the, the, regu the state law requires that some things have to be by site plan review, but not everything. And so we could have special permits for different things. So I don't think that state statute, it's, um, it's not going to be like a, a legal tether controlling regulations. The question I think for us is, as a community, what do we want to regulate? Um, I do want to always focus on the positive and then, of course, bring in the doomsday scenarios because that's what lawyers do and we, we deal with the doom. And so I would be really interested in hearing about what are, the, what, have, what are actual problems that have happened at solar facilities, large and small, probably you know, on the larger side. And I was doing some research in that. And you know, it really depends on where you are. And so I would, I think that's kind of important, you know, like one of the big, the giant facilities they have in the Mojave Desert, they actually produce this incredible sort of heat vortex. Like they try to consolidate and bring heat to heat up the oil or, you know, the steam or whatever, but they're actually changing. They're producing a tremendous amount of heat, you know, because only 25% of that, you know, the solar rays are used and so those are really negatives, not just for the ecosystem, but actually turn out to be sort of heating up the planet. And that's not going to be our problem in New England because we just don't have that weather. But I was really interested in like, you know, when when people from the public were talking to us about what happened with the cranberry bogs, I thought, I have no idea what they're talking about. Like, what was the impact on this wetland? Um, is that something that we have to worry about in terms of our wetlands and things like that? And you know, if we're monitoring, what are we monitoring against? Like, what, or if we're writing laws, what are we trying to prevent? What problems are we trying to prevent happening? And until I know what those problems have been, I don't really know what to write. And you know, one of the issues I had was the batteries. If, if there are large batteries on a facility being stored, um, you know, batteries when they start burning, they're filled with hazardous materials. And when they start burning, they have to be heated, they have to be cooled, they're temperamental. If they start to burn, they're really hard to put out and it'd be really hard to contain what's coming out of them. And I don't know if our fire department would be equipped for that. And so that's a kind of problem that I would, you know, mostly because my, my this is my husband's field, but I had also watched this long thing about Teslas burning up houses in California when their batteries spontaneously combust. And I was like, oh, this is a good thing for not having a garage. You know? <laughs> so those are the kind of problems I think, you know, we need to foresee happening and, you know, write regulations or controls, you know, foreseeing that that might happen. Like if we have a battery out in the field in a forest and it starts to burn, what then, you know, how does that, how is that handled or how is that contained in terms of its discharge and stuff like that? So that's the kind of bummer legal stuff. But I do really think we should also focus on like, how to encourage solar where we want it. And that would be good to talk to people from PV squared about you know, what's successful. There's an actual one acre lot in front of my house. And I was just thinking, well, we could just 
fire up and you know put panels there and Valley View would be covered. And I think the idea of the Wamego lines is fantastic. I've been walking under those lines because they're upgrading all the, it, they're huge. It's huge open space. And it, it cuts through Amherst and you don't even know it. That's it. Okay, thanks, Janet. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I just, um, you know, Janet brought up the wetlands and I, and I do think that the, the, you know, the existing, you know, wetlands, um, you know, bylaws are, are, are would be, you know, are gonna be protective. I mean, it, it, of any sort of development. They, uh, I think a solar field, you know, compared to, you know, like a parking lot or, you know, residential development is gonna have, well, you know, much less impact, but, you know, definitely you're gonna wanna, you know, be protective during that construction phase. And then mm -hmm. thereafter, just, you know, make sure, you know, it's gonna be protective. But I think we have a hundred foot buffer uh, you know, some areas 200 foot because of the Rivers Protection Act. Uh, those, those are, I think, I don't, you know, I don't think we need to override those for, for solar, but uh, we definitely need to, you know, incorporate that. And, and the battery thing, actually, yeah, that, that's, that's something I'm wondering, like, you know, these bylaws, do we take in, you know, do we include, you know, uh, sections for battery? Do we, do you want to, you know, uh, uh, sweep in like you know, uh, wind energy, you know, into this sort of thing, and just and kind of have it all encompassing for you know for energy type type things. You know, but um, the battery one is 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 a little bit of something that I'm not familiar with that that I would like to get more information on for sure. All right, thanks, Jack. So. We're almost at 9.15, and I made the perhaps rash statement earlier that I hope we didn't go to 10.30. Um, so I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm, I, I, we probably ought to uh, provide for a, a, some public comment if people want to speak to what they've heard this evening. And um, we also hoped to have at least a brief conversation about where we stand with some of the zoning proposals that we were working on last year. Um, Chris, Chris had an update spreadsheet for that. And um, then we've, I think that was the end of our formal agenda of, of particular you know, expected items. So, um, I guess I'm wondering, maybe we do public comment now and do another maybe 10 to 15 minutes of uh, board conversation if, if, if we need to. You know, I think, Chris, you might think about whether you've heard enough to get started uh, this evening. And then uh, we move on to our regular closing items and try to finish up, say, quarter of 10 or probably 10 o'clock by the time we're done. Um, does that sound okay? Yep, lots of nodding heads. Good, okay, so why don't we go to public comment at this time? Um, I'm hoping that all 18 of you don't need to speak for three minutes. Um, and in fact, uh, Pam, why don't we try two minutes just to see if people can be a little bit more concise. Um, all right, thanks. Okay, um, all right, so we'll start with Michael De Chiara. Uh, why don't we bring Michael in and Michael, please give us your name and your address. Yep, Michael De Chiara, actually 56 Pratt Corner Road. I live in Shutesbury, but I'm on the Shutesbury Planning Board. Um, so a couple of quick points. One is just an observation. I wanna commend you guys. Um, reflecting on a few meetings ago where it seemed like there was a discussion about you don't need a solar bylaw. I think you're discovering the complexity of solar. Um, so <laughs> that's great. Um, Doug, I wanted to, I, I liked your graph. I just wanted to give you some accuracy. So for Shootsbury and Pelham, uh, for Shootsbury, the, the limit size is 15 acres, but Shootsbury and Pelham are probably hidden in the definition section. It's not in the actually the, so it's there. I've always thought it's a weird place to stick it, but um, and Pelham, Pelham copied ours, so that's probably where theirs is as well. Um, the other thing I would just say, I actually, 
I think I mentioned this, but in December, I went through and looked at all the solar bylaws that were available online in the state. And there's 206 towns and cities that have them. Um, Shootsbury and Pelham, I, you know, it sounds like you're not gonna follow ours, but we are outliers. Um, there is sort of a template. There's a whole bunch of them that are very vanilla. Um, and if you start searching through, you, you'll start seeing them pop up. Um, the last thing I would just say is in terms of batteries, um, it sounds like you're addressing batteries. Batteries are, you know, they were called out specifically in the PVPC um, report for best practices that it can concern. Um, if you look at existing solar bylaws, they're not there. Um, the SMART program is just requiring them, you know, in the last year or so. So every SMART funded program is going to have batteries now, but pretty much all the bylaws that are in existence don't have them. Um, Shootsbury is developing an energy storage bylaw regardless of any energy generation source that will do. So just when you're looking, you probably won't find it, but it sounds like you're on top of it. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I'll uh, look for the definitions of in your, in your bylaw for the areas. All right, next we have uh, Phil Rich. Please uh, let's move him in and uh, get your name and your address and we'll reset the clock to two minutes. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, Phil Rich, 187 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna butter to one of the proposals, the, the, the AMP Coles proposal. Um, you know, I'm just concerned, like I've heard the word punitive uh, a couple of times now. I'm not quite sure what that's about. I, I don't think the concern um, is intended to punish solar development. It's just the opposite. It is intended, however, to make sure that it's prudent uh, and safe uh, and has, really no long-term detrimental effect either on the land or the ecosystem. What's on the neighbors in the town? I'm one of those neighbors to one of these proposals. And so I'm hoping that the bylaw will, will take the time to take everything into consideration without being punitive, but being prudent. And again, that includes ensuring uh, uh, the well-being, <laughs> I can't think of a better word, of, of people who are immediately abutting the access road uh, and the development of a commercial installation itself. So um, I, I, I'm interested to hear what that term punitive, uh, it's been used at least twice. So I certainly want to get off and be interested if there's any time to hear what people mean by punitive. That's it for me, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Phil. We'll have to think about that. All right, next we will have Steve Roof. Steve, we need you to give your name and your address again. Uh, yes, good evening. This is Steve Roof. I'm in South Amherst, 1680 Southeast Street. I am a member of the Energy and Climate Action Committee, otherwise known as ECAC. I'm also a professor, a researcher of climate change for about 40 years. And in the last 10 years or so, um, doing a lot with renewable energy development. I. I'm not quite sure what to say. Um, I hoped to be on in the group that helps develop this bylaw going forward. Um, I think what I'll say now is that I, I like what you guys said earlier, that a lot of this is gonna come down to values. Mm -hmm. and there's some technical aspects that we can work out. There's data, there's facts, we can work that out, but there's a lot of value judgments that have to be here. And there's, there's always a lot of concern when we're focusing on solar. What are the impacts of solar? How's it going to affect the groundwater? How's it going to affect um, the view shed? How's it going to affect the wildlife, the forests? I just want to, I guess, emphasize that we can't just look at the impacts of solar because what we're really trying to do is figure out how to become carbon neutral and how to stop burning fossil fuels. So whenever we look at the, the impact, potential impacts of solar, we have to compare those to the impacts of burning fossil fuels. If we don't do solar, we're gonna be burning more fossil fuels. And those fossil fuels are burned in low income neighborhoods throughout Massachusetts. They have huge impacts, health, economic and um, impacts, ecological impacts from the pollution in addition to the greenhouse um, gas impacts. So let's not, focus on solar by itself and look at all the bad things of solar, but let's always compare the solar benefits and impacts to the benefits and impacts of fossil fuels. So, so thank you guys. All right, thanks, Steve. 
All right, next we'll have Eric Bachrock. Please give us your name and your address. Uh, thanks so much. Eric Backrack, 277 Shootsbury Road. I'm hoping that the usual elements of uh, that will be considered by uh, four solar bylaws, such as site uh, uh, placement and size, design, construction, et cetera, monitoring, and ultimately removal, that those will not only be the, uh, that, the that other aspects um, will be integrated into the consideration for solar bylaw for the solar bylaw. Um, I'd hope also that several things other than those would be considered, uh, such as number one, the the Amherst Master Plan of 2010 calls for land conservation by keeping critical tracts of the highest quality habitats identified, undeveloped, and permanently protected. Second, the Master Plan also calls for the identification and permanent protection of lands, buffering Amherst water supply, its wells and reservoirs from development. I'd hope that the committees and boards working on this law will work together along with the town council. This might include the Amherst Conservation Commission, Water Supply Protection Committee we heard about, the Amherst Health Department and boards, They're, they have the sole um, jurisdiction of, of uh, governing and regulating quality of, of um, of private wells. Um, uh, I would hope that um, an in-depth critical analysis of where LSAs have gone wrong, gone bad, such as ones located in Williamsburg and Conway and why they did. Um, the issue of battery storage we've already talked about and those are so, so critical. Uh, then the, when we take down forests, ultimately we understand that what we are losing, we are losing their highest and best use purposes drought resilience, protection of wildlife habitats, protection of clean water, flood storage and management. By deforesting, we also release all the carbon that has been stored for many, many decades. By de I hope that we uh, make wise decisions in this town and that we not do not jettison our local ecology and irreparably threaten the balance of nature. Thank you so much for considering my comments. Thank you, Eric. Okay, next we have Dorothy Pam. Dorothy, if you'd give us your name and remind us of your address. Okay, uh, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. And uh, I was surprised when you said you'd been thinking about climate change for 30 years because uh, I remember the 70s and it was big and all the school children were taught about it and they came home and they cried and we, everyone was upset and then nobody did anything, okay? But it was really, really big there for quite a bit. Um, so uh, after listening to the items you've discussed today, uh, I just think how could anyone have not wanted a moratorium? It, this is complex and you have discussed so many issues that have to be looked at, examined, studied and decided on. And I'm so I know you've got a lot of experts already and I'm thrilled that you're going to be drawing upon people from the university. And uh, I know there will be trade offs. Uh, nothing will be perfect and satisfy everybody. But I think it's great to go into this having done the best you can of uh, thinking about things ahead of time and trying to do things in the best way possible. So I really do applaud you and all your work. So thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. And it looks like our last public comment is coming, will be uh, Lenore Brick. Lenore, please give us your name and your address. Uh, Pam, would you reset the clock? Thank you. Hi, sorry, Lenore Brick, 255 Strong Street. I might need three minutes. Um, I'm, uh, as we start this process of drafting the solar or uh, renewable energy law, I would like us to challenge some of our assumptions. Please do not assume that large scale solar installations have all gone well. There are examples of severe damage from projects all over the state, the region, the country, like in Wareham, Plymouth, Williamsburg. Um, and these towns were not uh, inferior to Amherst planning boards and they, and some of them had solar bylaws. Please don't assume that solar companies are equipped to understand the impact on the ecosystems or to anticipate long-term consequences. Please don't assume that, town, that the town solar bylaws that you're looking at were written, were created, um, informed by this influx of 
uh, foreign corporations coming into Massachusetts because of our state subsidies. And that is the reason it's happening on green lands, not just because there's not enough room on built landscape, but because it's more profitable. profitable. Please don't assume that there's adequate oversight. The state agencies have not been enforcing that. So who's going to do that here? And we can provide documentation on all of this. Please do not assume that our town's fair share of generating solar energy um, is, uh, you know, as the state and New England starts to look at regional approaches, uh, let's let's incorporate that also. Um, and please do not assume that large scale installations are the only and best way to address climate and, and biodiversity uh, collapse because it is a man-made technology. It is substituting for fossil fuels, which is great, but it's not a substitution for nature's technology, which through the miracle of photosynthesis takes the sun's energy and converts it to carbon matter, which is our food and which perpetuates life on earth. Our technology and our laws are not perfect and they'll keep changing, but nature's laws have been in place before we were here and will continue to run the show after we're gone. And I thank you for your time and efforts and your conversation was very interesting and very thorough. And I look forward to you doing that more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Lenore. Um, Eric uh, Bachrock, I see your hand up again. Um, if that is uh, not a legacy and you do want to speak again, Pam, can we give Eric one more minute? It's, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, it, it's not Eric, it's Renee Moss, it's, I'm his wife. So we're just using the same computer. Oh, I see. Okay, right. I, I, I don't have much to say. I just want to add one thing. Um, and, you know, again, as people before me have said, you know, to thank you for, for the work you're doing around this. But um, just in hearing the conversation this evening, I had one concern around, I think that I understand the importance of getting input from developers and um, people who do this work, but I hope that we will also get input from forest ecologists and people who represent a different perspective. You know, mm -hmm. as, as Lenore said, things are in motion. It, it, it's, this is science and it, we're discovering new things, more research, et cetera. And there is a perspective that you know, that the, what the carbon, the carbon sequestration, sequestration plus the carbon that escapes when you come bring a, when you take a forest down has more detrimental effects in the long run than um, putting up a solar array. And I know there's different perspectives on it. And I hope we get all of those perspectives when we consider this. And once again, thank you so much for um, giving it the attention you are. And um, I'm confident that the town will move forward and have a good bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, board members, um, any, any more discussion for this evening? Um, Chris, are you, do you think you've heard enough from us to sort of take a first pass at a, at a essentially a boiler, you know, a template? Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you know, uh, I think one of the one of the callers uh, said she could send some supplemental information. So mm -hmm. uh, I forget which of our callers that was, but you know, please do send information into Chris. She is she, Chris and Pam are very diligent about sharing all the information they have with us. So our inboxes are always full of emails from them. So, uh, okay, well, with that, why don't we end, end this topic for this evening? Uh, this is number 4A on our, on our agenda. The time is 9.30. And uh, why don't we move to 4B? Chris, do you wanna bring up the spreadsheet that you uh, put together? I, I think it might be helpful for us to see just the list of what initiatives we were tasked with by town council last year um, and where, where they all sit at the moment. So Pam is the talented person of bringing up her screen. I am hopeless at bringing up my screen. So I rely on right. Pam to help. This is towards the end of the packet. Mm. And I must say that Doug put together a much more 
readable version of this and maybe we'll send that out in the next packet or email it to you. Um, his version has different colors. Actually, Pam helped me with this. This was nothing but a gray kind of dull looking thing before Pam helped me to add some color to it and then Doug made it even better. So, but we haven't shown you Doug's version, but we will. Um, so anyway, this was uh, a request by Doug to give you an update on where we were with all of the bylaws that we were asked to work on last year or that we said we wanted to work on. And um, so the first part of the list is the town council priorities. And these are taken from um, the list that we went over with town council. Perhaps some of you weren't there, but there was a town council meeting on March 9th of 2021. And we gave them a PowerPoint presentation and um, they had given us a whole bunch of priorities that they wanted us to work on. And then we told them what we wanted to work on and we ended up with a with us with a list an agreed upon list but anyway um here we go town council priorities one of the things they wanted us to work on was adding footnote b to the bl zoning district and we did work on a version of that nate and rob mora worked on um, creating an overlay district for the bl district but it got um kind of what should i say uh Mm, it took a lot of work and it kind of got in the way of working on other things. So we uh, put it aside to work on other priorities, but we would like to go back to that. We think it has merit, um, but maybe maybe not in the short run because uh, we have a lot of other things on our plate right now. Um, revising this uh, supplementary, sup supplemental dwelling unit bylaw, that was something that we did accomplish. We're very proud of that. We drafted a new ADU bylaw and that was adopted by town council. Um, the demolition delay bylaw revisions, um, we drafted a new bylaw, which you have seen tonight and we'll be working on that further. And I'm hoping that um, Ben will have a chance to talk to Janet about some of her issues and maybe we'll come back with a um, a revision in a few weeks. Um, moving apartments to site plan review in more districts. We did manage to do that. We moved apartments to uh, site plan review in the RVC zoning district, but um, conversely, we moved apartments to special permit in the BG district. So that was something that we did accomplish and that was approved, adopted by town council. Removing footnote M turned out to be much more of a, um, kind of a thorny issue than we had expected once we delved into it. And so we did a lot of research, presenting and discussing, um, but we tabled that item in order to work on other priorities. But we think some of that may still have merit and maybe it's um, around the edges of the RG district that it makes sense to think about uh, either removing or relaxing footnote M. So that may be something that will come back to you. Um, revising the apartments definition. We did start out to do that. Um, we were going to um, lift the cap on the number of units that would be allowed in an apartment building. Um, that ran into a lot of um, concern on the part of residents and, and others. And so uh, we did table that due to other priorities, but we may bring that back again. Um, again, probably not in the near future, but my guess is we might bring it back sometime over the summer. Design guidelines or form-based code. Um, Town Council approved the funding of uh, $100,000 to work on that project. We're currently developing an RFP. Um, we have a draft and um, we hope to hire a consultant this spring as soon as the draft is in decent shape to show to the public, we will bring it to you and show it to you, but we still have some more work in house to do on that. Um, then there was the temporary moratorium on new buildings. The planning board recommended against adoption of that one and the town council did not adopt it. And we had the Article 14 temporary zoning, which relates to um, allowing um, more outdoor dining and some other uh, uses during this time of COVID. Um, that was revised. We revised the 2020 bylaw that was adopted in 2020. It was revised and readopted by town council this past December. Um, then we have the temporary moratorium on solar installations. And although the planning board recommended against adoption, 
of that at their December 15th meeting. Um, the CRC recommended uh, to adopt it at their January 27th meeting. So the town council is gonna be holding uh, first and second readings. The first reading will be on February 7th and the second reading will be on February 28th and they'll take a vote on February 28th. So my guess is that um, there were some changes made to the text. So now we have four town council members, or excuse me, five town council members who are in favor of this, uh, some of whom were not in favor of it the first time around. So. My guess is that's going to pass, but I, you know, I'm not necessarily so good at predicting things. Um, we have the rezoning of parcel 14A33, which is the parcel behind CVS, known as the town, uh, the town parking lot behind CVS. Um, there was a proposal to rezone that, and then the planning department came up with a an overlay district rather than um, going to a straight. BG rezoning, and that was adopted by town council. So we're very happy about that. Um, then we had parking regulations, which uh, we took the parking regulations related to residential uses and drafted a new bylaw, and that bylaw was adopted by town council. Um, there were several things that we uh, were asked to work on, and we didn't um, have time to work on them, including adding footnote A to maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage. What that would have done is um, have an option for someone to get a special permit to increase lot coverage or building coverage on properties, but we didn't have time to work on that. Um, working with the council on different housing types, uh, again, that would be like duplexes and triplexes and maybe quadruplexes um, and allowing them in more uh, places. Um, and removing the triplexes and the quadruplexes from the definition of apartments so that they could be treated differently. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have an opportunity to work on that. Town Council wanted us to work on uh, dimensional regulations in the RG and RBC zoning districts. Again, we didn't have time to work on that. Um, duplexes and triplexes, lowering the bar barriers <coughs> to development of those. Didn't have time to work on that. Um, and then Pam, can you scroll down a bit? I can. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, frontage, frontage regulations for residential districts, didn't work on that. Appropriate uses for village centers, um, didn't have a chance to work on that. I think that came about as, uh, we repeated that twice, we shouldn't have, but <clears throat> we were um, trying to promote residential use in village centers. So a member of the public, actually, I think it was a member of town council brought up the idea that we should um, make sure that we look at other uses besides residential uses in village centers and um, sort of make it, make it possible mm -hmm. to have a good life in a village center, um, you know, have food available, you know, pharmacy available and other uses, dry cleaners and things like that. Um, Transportation issues. Now, I'm not sure why that got put in this list, but uh, I think it was the CRC or town council that put that in our list. And we, um, the planning board doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with that, but um, we may find that we will be able to work on that in the future. Um, so let's see, what else? Uh, planning department priorities. We did have some success with our priorities. The mixed use buildings, definitions and standards was a new bylaw that we drafted and that was adopted by a town council. Um, inclusionary zoning, I'm very pleased that we were able to adopt a more robust inclusionary zoning bylaw. That was something that Janet McGowan has been really talking about and pushing for a long time and others as well. So, um, you know, we finally got that adopted and we have, I think there are 11 units, no, 22 units that we know about that will be coming about as a result of that in the near future. Um, Reconification, um, we did draft the new bylaw, but we haven't, we tabled it because we had other priorities, but we'll probably be bringing that back. And then flood maps and texts. Um, so what's the current state of the flood maps is that we, we have the maps, we've gone through the last appeal period on the flood maps. Um, we're expecting to get a letter of a letter of final determination from FEMA uh, sometime in the next month or so, probably in March. And um, once we get that letter, then we have six months 
to adopt the flood maps, and we also have to adopt a text related to flood mapping. And Nate is currently working on that, so he'll probably be bringing that to show you, um, you know, sometime in the next couple of months. Um, and I think we're meeting with our consultant on that project either maybe next week. Yeah, I think it's next week. So we're making progress on that. And hopefully I won't have to keep talking to you about flood maps for the next few years. Hopefully we'll get it resolved and finished and approved, um, you know, maybe by the end of the summer, maybe by September or October. So that is my rundown on um, zoning amendments, the things that we became aware of last year that people wanted to work on. And and I think we had a pretty good track record. We got seven of our amendments passed. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, so my thought with requesting this list was that we could use it to, you know, give ourselves a pat on the back for the hard work that was adopted, and then uh, talk about what our priorities might be for the coming year. Now we've already, you know, the solar bylaw has jumped to the front of the line. Um, and um, the, uh, the historic building preservation bylaw seems to be uh, right on the front burner right now. But uh, Chris, at what point do you anticipate staff would have time to come back to any of these that have been tabled? Is it, is it, is it March or is it May? I mean I'm going to guess May, because uh -huh. right now we're working on the flood mapping, we're working on the solar bylaw. We're also, um, I was asked to give an update on the design guidelines, so I'll, I'll try to do that. But that project is, we hope, going to launch relatively soon. Um, so we do have a number of things on our uh, burner right now. We've also applied to um, DLTA, Piner Valley Planning Commission has this program called district local technical assistance. And Jack um, kind of helped us to remember to apply for something this year. But one thing that's been um, talked about a lot, especially you know in the planning department and with the building commissioner, but it hasn't really gotten out to the public, is that farmers have come to us and said, we would really like to be able to have um, a brewery and have beer tastings and we would like to have a winery and have wine tastings and we would like to have the occasional wedding on our property and and maybe a seminar about something and there's really no slot that we can put those kinds of things into so what we did was um when Pioneer Valley Planning Commission came around with their offer of technical assistance this year we said well maybe that's something that we should focus on that's kind of a happy thing it's a thing that would you know lift people's spirits it would also be good for the for economic development it would be good to help farmers to um, you know be able to stay on their farms and um, so and we know other towns do it Northampton has you know the ability to do that and others do too and we want to figure out how can Amherst do it you know respecting the idea that um, people who live in those districts don't want a lot of traffic or noise or whatever, but there, there must be ways of doing these things that um, don't have a negative impact on the surroundings, but would also, um, you know, make Amherst an attractive place for people to come and also help um, with economic development. So we're looking into that. And if that, you know, if it, um, if it works and we get the grant and Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is willing to work with us, that's something that we would like to um, begin to work on as well. So in terms of, you know, working on other things on this list, I would say later this spring, maybe May is a good, a good time to think about that. Yep. Okay. So we should put a mark on our calendar to have a conversation about this in May then. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet, I'm seeing your physical hand raised. I went, I went old school. Chris, I'm, so I, Lynn Griesmer has been saying that she wants to look at other sites for parking garages downtown. Has there been discussion of that as a- Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yes, there has been a discussion of that with regard to asking for money for um, to evaluate the Boltwood garage for uh, its structural ability to handle another um, story or two. Um, other than that, we we don't have um, we're not um, actively looking, but if if some if town council tells us we really want you to look at this, then we'll work with them and try to figure things out. But right now we're just asking for money to look at the Boltwood garage. Take a, okay. All right, thanks. So <laughs> unless anybody else has any further comments on where we stand with all these things, I think we could, we could move on. Okay, um, next, uh, the time is 946 and we're at old business, item five in the agenda. Is it, Chris, is there any other old business? Nope. All right, uh, item six on the agenda is new business. Any other new business not anticipated? Janet asked me to give a, an update on design guidelines. Would that be an appropriate time to do that? Sure, why not? So, um, yeah, so what, as I said before, Nate is working on an RFP to hire a qualified urban design and architectural firm specializing in design, architecture, streetscape design, community engagement, and zoning to lead a public process for envisioning the future of the town center and developing downtown design standards for the town. Um, we've done some research on what other cities and towns have done and um, we think we've got a, a pretty good basis for an RFP. Um, we're hoping that we could put it out maybe at the end of February or sometime in the beginning of March and um, that we might be able to sign up and, and we would get responses and hold interviews sometime in April and then maybe sign a contract with a consultant in May. And we would like to finish this project um, by the time town council is this term of town council is finished so that we wouldn't have to lap over into another term of town council. So that's what we're thinking right now. Um, and as soon as we have that RFP in a decent enough shape, we'll bring it to you to show it to you. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, any other new business? Nope. All right. Uh, Form A, a and subdivisions, Any nope. anything? Not this time. I think we have two for next time. Is that right, Pam? I believe so. One, yeah. most definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, ZBA applications. I think you had mentioned one before, but it, are there any new ones? Um, I don't have any new ones to report tonight. I didn't mention anything tonight. Yeah. Not tonight. It was in a previous meeting. Oh. So, um, that's sorry, fine. But I have nothing new for tonight. Sorry. Nothing to report. <laughs> All right, uh, SP, SBR, and SUB. We do have a, an application from um, Susan Morello, who owns a house on, I think it's on High Street, and she would like to um, create an owner-occupied duplex. So she's going to be coming to you um, with that, probably. Um, she left a couple of days ago to visit her grandchild in Florida, so she's not going to be back for three weeks. So it, it'll be sometime about you know a month or so from now, but it's a, it's a nice project. And this is a duplex, not an accessory dwelling. It is a duplex. It's an it's an owner occupied duplex, which is allowed by site plan review in the RG district. She owns the buildings and building, and she's going to sell it to somebody who intends to occupy the building and rent the other unit. Okay. All right, we're, uh, it's now 9.50 and we're up to item 10, the planning board committee and liaison reports. Jack, do you wanna say anything about PVPC? Uh, nothing uh, significant, but I think the, you know, the infrastructure, you know, dollars, everybody's keeping their eye on that and, you know, how we can get, you know, better connectivity with, you know, Eastern Mass, Hartford, Okay. Whatever, but. Uh, All right, Andrew is not here to update us on CPAC. Tom, you, anything on DRB? Uh, not this week, no. Okay. 
Chris, anything on CRC? You've already mentioned that they talked about the solar moratorium. Did they talk about anything else? Yeah, well, they talked about the solar moratorium at their last meeting. Um, this meeting coming up. Um, Actually, yeah. would you mind telling us the members of the CRC now? Because we. Oh, can I remember the members of CRC? Let's see. Uh, there's um, Mandy, Joe, and Shalini, and um, Anna Devlin um, Gautier. And oh my goodness, it's too late in the evening for me to remember. Isn't, this. isn't Pam I, Rooney? Pam Rooney, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's there are five four. members. There's five altogether. I can look them up. And is Jennifer? Jennifer Taub, Taub? yes, yes, yes. She's the fifth? She's the fifth, yep. Okay. And apologies to everyone whose names I didn't remember. Do, do they have a regular meeting date? Did they switch or are they just popping around? They um, have a tentative meeting schedule that they're going to review tomorrow. They're meeting again tomorrow. They met on January 27th. They're meeting again tomorrow and then they're meeting February 24th. So they're going to vote on this tentative schedule on February 3rd and then they will have a, a schedule. But it's the meetings are going to be at 430 or at least Tomorrow's meeting is at 4.30 in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, and they're going to be considering an extension of um, Article 14, actually not an extension, but they're going to be looking at Article 14 and thinking about which of these things do we want to um, go forward with? In other words, are there things that we want to make permanent about Article 14? So that's one of the things. And the other thing I was, I've been asked to speak about it and I'm just drawing a blank on what it is. So um, I can send you an email about it, but I'd said I would be able to speak about it, but that's tomorrow, not tonight. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so that's it for committee and liaison reports. Uh, report of chair, I really don't have anything this evening. Report of staff, Chris, anything you want to say? Um, no, except uh, thanks again for all the work you did in 2021. And I hope that 2022 is going to be a little easier, but um, we have a lot on our plates. OK. And so the time is 9.53. And unless there, I see any objections, we can adjourn. Yes. All right. Thank you all. Okay, thanks. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. I'll just double send to the back.